Well, the Hi-Fi Rush PS5 reviews are here, and while I'm not totally surprised, I am very pleased to see that the game is getting great scores already. And the reason I'm not surprised is because Hi-Fi Rush is a great game. It was the highest scoring Xbox game last year, and there's other reasons for it to get great scores, because many people might think that the PS5 is the definitive way to experience Hi-Fi Rush because of the DualSense controller and the added immersion that we're hearing about from the haptic feedback. Now, I'll be trying out the game later today on my PS5. My daughter played it. She beat it on the Series X. Very minor, very infrequent help from me, and so I didn't get a lot of experience with the game. A lot of the times when I would play the game, I was having a hard time because I hadn't gone through the early stages. I hadn't gone through the tutorial, so I will be playing the game today. I did play it a little bit last night. I'll give you some of my thoughts. Now, in 2023, I had nothing but praise for Hi-Fi Rush, so I am looking forward to seeing how the game feels with the haptics and how it runs on the PS5. I'm already very very, very uh, pleased with the port. It looks and runs very well. But I also want to look at the reviews that are already hitting. How's the game doing on Metacritic? Now, keep in mind, at the time of me recording this very early on the 19th of March, there were only eight reviews for the PS5 version on Metacritic. So the score is a little bit higher for the PlayStation 5. I don't think that's because people are basically, oh, it's better, or the Xbox tax, which isn't true. It's because there's not enough reviews yet. I do see this probably landing with a very similar score to Xbox. If it's a point or two higher, that's not a big deal. It has more features, so that might actually happen. But I also expect many people to look at the reception of this as the second Xbox game, but probably the first major Xbox title hit PS5 as sort of the changing of the era or the time. This is a pretty big, significant thing, and this is sort of the first game to sort of mark that. So I put all of the good information right here at the beginning. It sort of opens up the show like a monologue. Now, there's great ways to support the channel listed below in the video. Just hitting like and subscribe is the best way to help, and if you want to go beyond that and directly support and get more content, hit the join button and pick the $6 member tier. Well, the day has arrived, and Hi-Fi Rush is now available on the PS5. So what are the reviews saying, and is the PS5 now the definitive place to play the highest-reviewed Xbox title of 2023? Now, I'll be honest, I'm not surprised that the game is getting good review scores right now. It had great scores on Metacritic, great scores on Xbox, and great scores on Steam, sort of the trifecta. It was arguably the most consistently scored Xbox first-party game in 2023, but the dual sense and the haptic feedback they are showing up in some of the reviews and some of the feedback people are saying it really is adding the dual sense controller and the haptic feedback was once decried as a gimmick well it's showing up as a great feature in an xbox title so first i want to look at what some of the reviews are saying right i already knew the game was good i watched my daughter beat it i helped her out every once in a while and i could tell that it was a very very good game but i am looking forward to trying out the game myself later today i will be doing a live stream on reforge gaming playing through the game on ps5 now second i want to look at how folks are reacting to the game coming to PS5, right? Some are claiming there's an Xbox tax because the Metacritic score is a little bit higher. There just aren't enough review scores just yet. Now, I asked folks if they were planning on getting this game on PS5, and I will share some of their responses here. Lastly, I will tell you what I think. I did play the game for a little bit last night. I'm looking forward to playing it today. And this game and Sea of Thieves are probably the two Xbox titles that I am the most interested in seeing how well they do with PlayStation. Pentiment didn't really draw me in that much, and Grounded... I think Grounded will do okay, but I think Sea of Thieves and Hi-Fi Rush are probably the two, you know, bigger titles. So, what are the reviews saying? Well, first, let's start with Noisy Pixel, and they titled their review, Hi-Fi Rush Review, New Home, Same Awesome experience and i really hope that that theme runs throughout the reviews and the reception okay this is a great game and it always has been and they have i think they deserve high praise for the game and noisy pixel gives the game very high praise in their review they say the heart of this experience is the masterful action coupled with the lovable character dynamics So the combat, I do think, is the thing that is where people are going to sort of focus their attention. The combat's infused with rhythm. They did say some of their concerns were like, well, what if I don't enjoy the music, right? There's music basically playing the entire time. And they actually give an answer that might give you some hope because you might be thinking, well, what if the music doesn't fit my style? What if I don't like it? And this is what they had to say. In all honesty, none of the songs in Hi-Fi Rush fit my tastes, including both the licensed tracks and original compositions. However, I rarely 
rarely felt my distaste impact my enjoyment of the gameplay since being cognizant of the current song's beat took far more precedence over what I thought about the music. So if you're kind of worried about that, like, well, what if I don't like the music? What if the music's no good? You don't have to worry. They, they, they didn't, they weren't particularly fond of the music and they enjoyed the game quite a bit. That should be welcome feedback to anybody who's sort of concerned about the music and the music style in the game. Now, the only critique I could find in their review was about replaying the content. When you replay the content, you can go for S tier ranks. And they said, if there's one major critique I have, I wish you could turn off all dialogue, tutorials, and scenes during stage replays since they can all become somewhat grating when attempting S ranks. So this, I think, is a minor critique, but I do think it is good feedback for the devs if they want to consider some post-game gameplay updates and tweaks nothing major here but when it comes to the game being on ps5 they actually see this as being a huge win and they have very high praise they say it's no exaggeration that despite greeting the playstation 5 over a year after initial release hi-fi rush feels at home here primarily thanks to the dual sense controller the carryover functionality from the pc version of the title with the haptic feedback and the adaptive trigger support that when coupled with the time rhythmic attacks instills indescribable levels of immersion moreover the controller's speaker is utilized for various sound cues including picking up upgrades discovered throughout stages a minor appreciated touch of polish so they are saying listen man the dual sense really takes this up now there was dual sense support already on steam but for playstation owners this is probably welcome feedback and a welcome review this is not the only review to highlight this making it clear that the dual sense is going to play a role in the experience and the immersion which is why i'm asking like is this the best place to play hi-fi rush they concluded their review and they gave it a nine and a half a 9.5 and they labeled it as a must play now the gamer.com titled their review hi-fi rush ps5 review unbeatable encore and they were not the only one to use the word encore in their review title Now, the review is quick to note that, quote, Hi-Fi Rush's PS5 release is identical to the Xbox Series X version, only with enhanced controller vibrations and certain audio coming from the DualSense's speaker. It's not enough to say one is better than the other, but I think the extra touches made me prefer the PS5 version. Just this morning, one of our community members, Sven, said the same thing. I played a little bit last night on the PS5, so did he, and he was like, I was going to be ready to push back and say, it's not the definitive version, but he's now saying it really feels like it is because those extra touches are sort of leveling up the game and the quality and if you want to call that an xbox tax maybe talk to xbox about why they didn't invest in a controller with more features like a speaker or haptic feedback everybody decried it as a gimmick and now it's being praised as one of the reasons that hi-fi feels better on a ps5 now they also made special mention of boss fights they say hi-fi rush's combat is an absolute best it's it's as it's absolute best during its many boss fights which put your rhythm skills to the test and make you feel like a musical god when you get it right the rogue fort fight alone is worth the price of admission Now, they conclude the review and they give it a four and a half out of five. Oddly enough, the PushSquare.com review made no significant mention of the haptics, which Push Square is kind of a PlayStation outlet. I thought they would have really had a lot of praise there. They gave the game a nine out of ten. They said it was an essential title. However, they did point out that sometimes inputs don't register, which was leading to frustration in certain fights. Now, when the game first turns on, it says that it runs in low latency mode to help with your input latency they did say on this splash screen when you first turn the game on that if you ever you know are frustrated by it or it doesn't seem to be working to check your monitor or your television make sure it's running at the refresh rate or uh, I saw people turning off V-Sync. So I did a little bit of research into this. Like, why would they be getting input latency or input problems? I played last night. I had zero problems. Once I found the rhythm, I was doing exactly the combos and the things that it had taught me how to do. I could not find anybody complaining about input issues with Hi-Fi Rush other than somebody who was using their Steam Deck and somebody, and they had to like run it in like the lowest settings to get the, some of the problems to go away. And then somebody needed to disable V-Sync on their PC and it solved their problem. 
So it is possible they're having an issue with their display or their TV. I didn't see anybody, any of the other outlets are not mentioning this. So some outlets may have consoles hooked up through a capture card by default, and that can add latency at times. So whoever was writing for Push Square may have sat down to play the game, and the game's being funneled through a capture card that might not be configured properly, and it might have been adding some latency. I had that experience once in Sekiro, and I made changes to my capture card, and it went away. I was like, I know I'm hitting the button at the right time and it like wasn't counting I was losing frames basically through the capture card now gaming trend gave this game a 95 for their PS5 review and they concluded that hi-fi rush comes back to the stage in a pitch perfect port that may well be the best version of the game it looks gorgeous and runs flawlessly with the dual sense features being a great addition to the game now they also said that the controller speaker made certain things in the game easier which I thought was interesting. I didn't see anybody really make mention of this. Like, a bunch of people made mention of the speaker. And they said, in addition to the controller actually making some aspects of the game easier, certain sound effects will come out of the controller, like when entering a parry duel, that help isolate the sound and make it easier to hit the timing. So, they seem to think that the controller is not just adding immersion, but it's kind of helping you out a little bit with the sounds. Lastly, the Gaming Bolt video review on YouTube is titled a must play for PS5 players and they had high praise for the boss fights and they ended up concluding by giving the game a 9 out of 10 saying that it lives up to the hype. So, overwhelming great response. People are loving the game all over again, which isn't surprising. It's always been a good game, but they're now seemingly saying this is the best pay- place to play it because of the DualSense controller. So what type of responses are we getting? I basically asked people on Twitter, I was like, hey, are you going to be checking this game out on PS5? And one of the first themes that I noticed in people sort of replying to my tweet, many are simply passing on the game because it's not their thing <clears throat> or there's just a lot of games coming out this week okay it certainly is a very full week you got dragon's dogma 2 rise of the ronin even the princess peach game showing up on the nintendo switch so i could see folks saying listen i don't really dig rhythm games right i'm I'm gonna pass on this i'm gonna give you some of my input at the end of this because i played last night for about 45 minutes or so just kind of trying to get through the opening tutorial areas so that my live stream didn't have to have that because it takes a while for the game to kind of like let go and you know all the systems now, which is totally fine. I think the tutorial is very helpful. Don't don't skip through it. Go to this robot here and, and practice every time you learn something new. It actually is quite helpful. So I will give you some of my thoughts as somebody who's like, I'm not really into rhythm games either, okay? But I'm giving this game a shot. My daughter loved it so much. And I got to tell you, I had a great time last night and I was sort of kicking myself. Like, I think I missed out on playing this game before now. I had a lot of people also saying that they tried it on Game Pass and it just wasn't their thing. They didn't like it. Now, that's certainly an advantage to Game Pass subscribers. You can try out a game that you would ordinarily avoid and then just put it down. We saw that with Lies of P as it scored the lowest on the Xbox console, but it hit Game Pass. So tons of people tried a game that they ordinarily would pass on. And I think that's an excellent, you know, leverage point and value point that Game Pass subscribers can utilize now on the positive side of things i saw people saying listen i want the limited run games physical copy so some people are waiting for that and i i do think at this point many people have just accepted digital only right the pc gaming world's been digital only for a while uh the console world a lot of us have just shifted to digital so it's cool that many still want physical releases i think that's awesome i honestly don't buy physical unless i'm getting like a collector's edition because i want like a a statue or some cool collector's item but i think it's great for folks who want that limited run edition now i also some people say hey i loved it on xbox and i can't wait to get the trophies on playstation i definitely have to admit now that i find myself more planted on the playstation ecosystem that completing a game on playstation feels like something i'm more likely to do than on xbox my series x just doesn't really get turned on anymore unless it's absolutely necessary uh hellblade 2 this year avowed you know indiana jones and hopefully i don't have to retreat to pc to get 60 fps in any of those games whenever i first got into playstation it was literally just because i wanted more guardians in destiny as a content creator it allowed me to play with more people and it never really was the place where i felt the draw to establish a library 
on PlayStation. Well, a lot has changed in the last four years. So I kind of resonate with those who feel more attached to their digital library and their trophies and their achievements because I myself have sort of leaned in a direction. Now, I did get a response that I wanted to reply to. Somebody was saying, well, I don't don't buy games to console war, okay? <laughs> I Listen, I get it. I, I certainly think there are folks doing that. They're going to buy this game and try to, like, rub it in the faces of Xbox fans because Twitter is basically a, a place of, you know, trolling and some of it's lighthearted and fun. Some of these people are friends. I don't particularly like it because I think some of these people mask, you know, cruelty and unkindness with, oh, we're just goofing around. It's just satire. I don't think so, but... Uh, I also think there are consumers who just want to support Xbox games coming to PlayStation, right? They want to see more Xbox ports in the future, right? For me, I like to support good games, and I've had nothing but high praise for Hi-Fi Rush. Sea of Thieves, I think, will certainly be a bit different for me, primarily because I'm going to buy Sea of Thieves on PS5 to cover it. I want to see what a new player experience is like on PS5, like... Can we turn off crossplay? Am I going to have to worry about veteran C of these players on, you know, PC and Xbox kind of ruining my day? But if I was not a content creator, I would likely skip the PS5 version of Sea of Thieves, as I've already played that game enough to know it's just not a game I would ever spend a lot of time in unless they did a PvE-only mode. Yes, I know they added Safer Seas. That's basically just a tutorial mode where you don't really earn anything, you don't really progress. It's the most half-measure, half-measure I've ever seen. Now, some of the replies to my tweet about Hi-Fi Rush pointed out that the game currently had a higher score on Medic critic for ps5 than xbox now to be fair it's only based off of eight reviews and it's at a 91 and then there's like 63 xbox reviews and it's at an 87 now that's a four point difference okay take your xbox tax nonsense and stop it you look silly okay i imagine once all the reviews drop it's going to have a very very similar score okay the dual sense and the haptic immersion factor might raise some scores but it's not going to be evidence of this mythical fake xbox tax okay it merely shows that a game will score better when it gets more features that enhance the mechanics and enhances the immersion Right, The only Xbox tax you're paying for is a lack of tech innovation from Xbox. They didn't do anything with the controller for developers to tap into. So if there's three, two or three points of difference between the Xbox Metacritic score and the PlayStation Metacritic score, that's just one or two extra points because of the added immersion and the added features. That's exactly what I would come to expect from a game that has more on it on one particular version. Now, I did see some, you know, cliche responses. People were saying, oh, it's a mid-game, I'm not interested. I also saw people saying, you know, hey, I love this game, and I'm excited for PlayStation fans to enjoy it. There was no clear trend in the answers. Largely, the vibe around this, I think, felt positive. I think people are excited. So let me give you my thoughts on the game, why I'm diving in today with a gameplay stream. You know, I'm going to include some of my thoughts about, you know, how I played last night. First, I want to restate that I praise this game any time it came up in 2023. The only negative thing, and I don't even think this is a negative thing, but the only thing I said that could be construed as negative or, you know, clipped to make it look like I'm being negative was I said it's not really a next-gen game. Whenever we were having discussions about Xbox's sort of lack of next-gen first-party titles, people would say, well, Hi-Fi Rush is next-gen only. Well, okay, but this is not something that you would put out front and center to really show off next-gen power. Now, this is largely due to the art style. It's really hard to convey graphical fidelity or a feature like ray tracing or high resolution with a cartoon-style, almost cel-shaded game. It's not to say that the game is not good-looking. I think it's gorgeous. I actually think the art style is very strong. And I think it proves the point that art style endures over focusing on graphics in 10 years hi-fi rush will still look good because of its art style while games striving for more realistic lighting or water textures and graphics they're going to look more dated you'll be able to tell that games right now going for photorealism you'll be able to tell they're old in 10 years hi-fi rush has that saturday morning cartoon feel to it like it's always going to look nice as well unless people just get accustomed to 
crazy frame rate. It, you know, it runs at a very stable 60 frame rate as far as I could tell. So outside of my remarks about the game not being next gen, which again, in context, isn't about the fact that the game isn't next gen. It just isn't a next gen demo. You wouldn't use this to show off and say, look how powerful our box is. I have been very consistently praising this game, which is one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to checking out the port, right? From a porting perspective, I'm interested to see how solid the Xbox games port over this year. It may add credence to some of my thoughts about how the PS5 is very easy to develop for. I played the game a little bit last night, and I thought it ran flawlessly. I had no problems whatsoever. I also kind of love that the claims about the dual sense haptic feedback, oh, it's a gimmick. I love that that's being dismantled by an Xbox game. I find a bit of humor in that. I've had plenty of the Xbox loyal over the last three years tell me that haptic feedback and the adaptive triggers are just a gimmick. I've continued to say that, you know, I had my own doubts in the beginning about the DualSense controller, but I've been impressed by the implementation and the immersion points that haptic feedback can add now i will say i've never been a huge fan of the adaptive triggers okay i've always thought the adaptive triggers when they sort of resist my movements or something i always sort of felt like i didn't like that they if if they provide too much resistance they're sort of irritating but the speaker and the haptics i think are a great addition to my gameplay experience now i even plan to ask my daughter what she thinks she loved the game on the xbox so i'm gonna have her try this out on the playstation and see if she has anything to say i'm not going to feed her any information i'm just gonna say you know what do you think does it feel any better look any better you know or does it feel mostly the same now i will say this i am still holding out hope that the game can land on the nintendo switch 2 because i feel like the art style and the vibe of this game would just crush it with the nintendo audience at this point the only other major thing i'm curious about is the commercial success and the commercial reception of the game what role will that play in other titles making the jump even though i feel xbox already has a great slate of games actually i think they have a slate of games i'm sorry for the second half of 2024 i think more games are coming more games are going to jump over to PlayStation. Uh, The question is, are they going to be analyzing the success of a game like Hi-Fi Rush and make decisions accordingly? So overall, I am pulling for Hi-Fi Rush, personally because I like telling my daughter how good the game's doing when it gets nominated for awards. I told her last night, I said, hey, I'm covering one of your favorite games, but also because I want to see it do well, given how much praise the game has already received. But that's just my take. What's your take? So let me give you my closing thoughts and conclusion as a way to transition to talking to the live audience about this. Now, some see Hi-Fi Rush coming to PS5 as the beginning of the end. I've even seen tweets claiming that this is the end of an era. And honestly, it kind of is. You know, gone are the E3 days where two showcases and a list of game announcements would be compared and kind of go head to head. And with the PS5 Pro rumors and the stats mounting, we're now even hearing from an Xbox podcast that they have a source at EA that told them Jedi Survivor is hitting 4K 120 on a PS5 Pro dev kit. Now, if this information is accurate, it corroborates the specs and the targeted performance that we covered just yesterday in my PS5 Pro stream and i honestly i I don't know what to think like playstation seems to be on the precipice of not just being the premier console but cementing that position as the premier high-end console in the market and with gta 6 on the horizon that could be a very very strong position to be in the second thing i want to say is i played a little hi-fi rush last night to get past the tutorial for the sake of our gameplay stream that we'll be doing in a little bit but I'm sort of kicking myself. Folks who think that they won't enjoy this game because they don't enjoy rhythm games, you might be right. But I thought the same thing. And I do have a background as a drummer. I was in a band, so I can certainly pick out the tempo and when I'm sort of supposed to hit certain things. And I was able to get off some very satisfying combos. I was seeing, you know, S's and A's and B's on the right side of the screen when I would end little sequences. 
And I definitely know my daughter wasn't playing that way. She just sort of enjoyed the game and wasn't going for, you know, great combos and and the rhythm aspect. It honestly, in my opinion, does not feel like a rhythm game. So maybe watch my gameplay stream. You know, if you're watching this past broadcast later, look for that gameplay stream and see if maybe my experience convinces you to give the game a shot. My conclusion is this. While some may see this as the end of an era, it's kind of the beginning of a new one as well. And honestly, there's good and bad that could come from it. It'll be good for Xbox to be publishing games in a context where sales matter. I would hope that curbs down the launches of games that are clearly not ready, like Halo Infinite's multiplayer, or Redfall, or Forza Motorsport. These things were not ready for prime time. But when you're keeping that game past cadence, things just have to come out. You have to consider different things when you're trying to sell games on other platforms. And the quality of Hi-Fi Rush is undeniable. So if it sells well on PlayStation, I hope it sends the right message. My main critique of Xbox the last few years has been they're not really built or set up for creative work. And Microsoft is to blame for that, not Xbox. Maybe Phil can win some good internal battles. You know, have that 18-month contractual policy change because it ruined Halo Infinite in 343. Maybe start pushing out higher quality games in order to drive sales and profit. I don't like a future where Xbox abandons the hardware fight and focuses more on cloud or some type of a hybrid console cloud device, but if their publishing shifts into a quality-centric model versus a cadence-centric model, well, I'll celebrate that. So while the future is unknown, there could be both good and bad that come out of this brand new era that we're entering into, and Hi-Fi Rush seems to be kicking it off. But those are just my thoughts. Now it's time to hear your thoughts. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, guys. That is the show open. Thank you so much for being here today. Go through the ritual of smashing the like button. We will be checking this game out later on the PS5. And uh, the reason we want to do that is I played a little bit last night. I got through the tutorial areas, I think. I think I'm mostly beyond the tutorial areas. Because I really want to show this game off. I've always thought this was a good game. And I want to show people, like, listen, I'm not a really big... I'm not a rhythm guy either. Um, I'm not a rhythm guy either. But this game doesn't feel like a rhythm game. It really doesn't. It feels like an action game with some rhythm elements is how I would describe it. You know? Miss the show open. Good to see you, Darth Ascension. Uh, there's a bot in chat. Yeah, that was just somebody spamming something. We already took care of it. Don't worry about it. Permanence in the modern gaming zeitgeist. Oh, perhaps you played a lot more than the hot topic flavor of the week type games that get talked about in the modern gaming landscape. There's a lot less games that hold any sort of permanence. I'm not sure what you're talking about, Corey. Just like Lono says, games take four or five years and are still released unfinished. Well, for sure. And I think part of the problem with that is, you know, everything changes so fast once they're building their game like imagine building your game right now right imagine uh you're building a game right now it's 2024 and you just started your game okay your game's gonna come out in 2029 or 2030 well who knows what people want by then who knows what people think is boring or played out or tired The, the, the tech world and gaming sentimentality changes so much in five or six years, do you have any idea what people are going to want to do? You know, people place bets. Fundamentally, that's what developers are doing right now. They're placing bets. And you wonder why a lot of these guys just dial in a sequel or a remaster or a remake or they do a game that, you know, is sort of within their wheelhouse. That's probably why you see a lot of that. Because like, I don't know what people are going to want to play in five or six years. You know? That's why uh, we mostly see only sequels. Sure. And, well, sequels are usually evidence of a new IP having success. Like, when a, when a game like Horizon or something launches, and then they get their sequel, well, that's the reward of having a successful IP launch. You know, if Hi-Fi Rush gets a sequel, it'll be the reward of the fact that their, their, their game launch was so good. Excuse me. 
adapt or move along. It's really hard to adapt because depending on your project size and your studio size, it's like trying to turn an aircraft carrier. Now, obviously games like Hi-Fi Rush could certainly make adjustments maybe a little bit easier, but even then, the foundations of the game, they decided to build a rhythm action game. You know, and what if by the time it got to, you know, testing phase and they were letting some, you know, some people test it out and give feedback, people are like, yeah, these kind of games, they don't really blend that well. An action game that's like a rhythm game at the same time, you know, what are they going to do at that point in time? Now, thankfully, I think it works incredibly well, but I'm just imagining an alternate reality where people got their hands on Hi-Fi Rush and said, I don't think you can blend an action game with a, with a rhythm game, Right. What are they going to do if they start to get that feedback? Like, we've seen that happen with a lot of games recently. Like, they're in development for five, six years or more. And when they finally come out, people are like, why'd you make this? Nobody's looking for this kind of game. It's like, well, we thought people would like this five or six years ago. As as far as I can recall, you like Sekiro. Would you consider it a rhythm game? Why did Lord Horror get hit? Oh, you put on dot my. You didn't put a space, Lord Horg. Nightbot thought you tried to post a link. I don't consider Sekiro a rhythm game, but I can see why you would say that. You would say, you know, if you liked Sekiro, Sekiro was fundamentally a rhythm game. Okay, the difference would be Hi-Fi Rush gameplay Everything is happening on a, on beat. That's not true in Sekiro, right? Like, the UI is pulsating. You've got a little thing floating next to you with a light that's pulsating so that you know, right? Doom, 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 doom. One, two, three, four. Hit the button on the beat, right? That's, that's baked into Hi-Fi Rush. And if you can't get into that and you can't match that rhythm it's going to 100% mess with your you know how strong you are and your and your efficacy. So, yes, I get where you're coming from, but I also think you've got to consider the fact that this game from its head to its toes is a rhythm game. Yo, there it is. Han shot first and so did you. Andrew Founders is going to do the first gifted member of the day taking things and starting us off. Every 25 members, guys, I give 5 we are shooting for 2,500. We'll do an extra community game night. We kind of already did a community game night with Hell Divers and Madam. Uh, we kind of shoutcasted y'all's gameplay the other night. We'll do another one on the final Friday of this month. We just need to hit 2,500 members, and we're at 2,382. So you guys are about 100, 100 members away. You're basically 100 members away. If you hit 100 today, we hit the goal, because I would gift 20 in addition to that, because I give 5 every 25. So hit 100 today. We're going to hit the goal. Let's secure that. And then we'll maybe have a stretch goal. Maybe we'll do something else. We'll do something fun during that community game night. You didn't rhyme. I'm disappointed. Sorry, Trill. Having rhythm doesn't mean that you, you can rhyme, right? You know, feel the rhythm, feel the rhyme. I can feel the rhythm. And then I, and that's, that's it. That's where, that's where it goes. <laughs> Hi-Fi has accessibility features to aid those with no rhythm. What f- well, I didn't even look at the accessibility features. What do they have to help you if you don't have rhythm? I mean, they have the thing you can turn on at the bottom of the screen if that's what you're talking about. I, I'll be honest with you. I run that for a little while. I might turn it off today and see if it affects my gameplay. I was running it last night, you know? The little doom, 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 doom. Like the beat, you know, coming in through the middle. Lona was only able to make it halfway through that. That's right. <laughs> uh... I was freaking tired, man. Leave me alone. Like any work of art, you do things that wants to make it in the moment. You can't predict how it's going to be received. The rush in the veins, but not that much these days. Yo, Patrick Q with 20 months in a VIP says, get on up. It's bobsled time. There it is. Somebody caught the reference. Thought Lona was a drummer. I am. Yeah, I can feel the rhythm. I haven't had an issue finding the rhythm in this game. You know, I think the only thing I'm struggling with now is you want to try to dodge on rhythm, which is awkward because the enemies swing on on beat, but you want to dodge a little bit before that. That's the only thing I'm I'm not landing like as a way to kind of keep things going. You're like hit, 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 dodge, hit, hit like I'm that's the only thing because like 
I played so many action games. Like, as soon as somebody's swinging at me, I'm like, dodge. Like, I'm immediately wanting to dodge out of the way, as opposed to, like, trying to time it, if that makes sense. If you guys are just tuning in, we're talking Hi-Fi Rush PS5 Review Roundup. The reviews are, are doing quite well. There'll be more to hit today. Uh, do me a favor. If you haven't yet, smash the like button. Uh, and you can hit subscribe if you want to talk in the chat. Subscribing is totally free. Uh, that doesn't cost anything. Membership is the thing that we have where you can join, pick the $6 tier, and you get into all of the extra content. I played about 500 hours of Sekiro on my first playthrough. It actually helped me on some bosses to use the tempo of the soundtrack as references on when to deflect. Just curious what others think. That's incredibly interesting. Has anybody made any kind of content about that? Like, is that something... Is that something subversive that they baked into Sekiro or you just I've never heard that before. That's extremely interesting to me because there was definitely a boss where he was in that small room and he's swinging like crazy and there was everything like you're like ting 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 like it was like a speed up. That one was really fun. And a gifted member from Joker Quinn and a gifted member from Pierre. We got a little single gifted member train going right now. The single gifted from Joker Quinn goes to Darth Ascension and Pierre's single gifted goes to Eddie Rodriguez taking us to three members on the day. Thank you guys so so much and good to see names like Darth Ascension and Eddie get them. We know they're here on the regular nitro says i would like to see playstation games come to xbox too as someone who doesn't own a next gen xbox otherwise i think it just creates all this negativity when playstation players keep attacking xbox people like i i get that twitter can give you an impression of reality that's not the reality you know brother the average person that's booting up this game playing it and reviewing it they're not doing it to console war. They're not doing it to, to you know, thumb their nose at Xbox. The average gamer is like, oh, I heard about that game. That game looks cool, and they're buying it. I think the price point's helping it. I think the art style's helping it. I think the notoriety's probably helping it. I, I, I think the game will do quite well on PlayStation because of all those things. And listen, on the token of, like, I see a lot of people saying, well, is PlayStation going to start putting games on Xbox now? The business angle just isn't there. I'm just going to be honest with you. If you've seen the sales reports of how much all consoles have consoles have slowed. PlayStation sales have slowed by 2%. This is to be expected at the halfway point of a generation, right? Halfway point of a generation, you hit your apex, and then you start to come down. Not alarming at all to see the PlayStation have a 2% slowdown, Okay. Nintendo Switch seen a 17% slowdown. Again, not alarming. They're seven years in, okay? Xbox has seen a 47%. Now, if you consider the business angle of that, the fact that they didn't do a good job saturating the market in the first three to four, and they're they're seeing a 47% slowdown of already being in a bad spot. Like, they're already not selling tons of consoles, and it's dropped by like 47%. There's no business angle for PlayStation to allocate funds to port games to a platform that isn't that isn't doing very well that's that doesn't have a strong foothold in the market that's a smaller it's a smaller user base they're accustomed to game pass like none of what i just said is hate or being anti xbox it's just basic market analysis it's like this is totally a business argument at the end of the day it's down two percent over a month where it was like 200 percent up the previous year yeah you also have to look at that like it's it's down two percent when compared to a month that was insanely high. So even PlayStation slowdown, it's not really a slowdown. Like it's like we're four years into the life cycle, and they're basically keeping pace with where they were when you know the previous month was at like a two hundred percent. So you got to consider the fact that from a, from a business angle and listen I'm the guy that when hell divers dropped I said I actually would have no problem with this going to Xbox I'd have no problem with it hitting game pass why get more people in the game you get more people playing okay as long as it can be ported well and run well and the in the the Xbox users get a good game I'm fully in support of that I was fully in support of power world going multi-plat it probably is according to the developers recent commentary but I don't see a business angle. I don't see a business angle for PlayStation to say, oh, 
people have said things like, well, they should return the favor or as a sign of goodwill or something like that. Let me be real with you. Hi-Fi Rush coming to PlayStation is not an act of goodwill. I want to say it's an act of desperation because that makes for a great clip. It's not an act of desperation, but it kind of is. It's like, we got to make money with this product. We're not, we didn't make any money on this product, right? There's, there's business motivation behind what Xbox is doing. They're not doing it to be nice. Xbox isn't like, well, let's give Hi-Fi Rush to PlayStation to be nice. That's not it at all. So there's no return the favor. It's, you guys are kind of crushing it over there. Uh, can we can we sell our we want to sell our game over there? Like you guys are doing a good job, you know. It would be like putting your game on Steam and then thinking that like, well, Valve, can you do us a favor now? You put your game in Steam because you're trying to make money, right? You're not doing a, a favor to Steam. Mick D09 with 26 months in a VIP says, smash the like button. Thank you so much. It's a strategic shift. It's not desperate. Right, I don't like using the word desperate because it's like, oh, like they're panicking. It's like, we need to do this. There's a, there's an impetus of need, Zubair, that I think you could use, you could softly use the word desperate. I think there's an impetus of need. Like, yeah, we kind of need to do this. Our current model's not working. Stuff like old remastered God of War or something? No. No. Corey says, it is an act of desperation. You can't be in business and not sell anything. You have to sell games. Xbox also dropped $80 billion and, and investors want that 80 back. There is that angle as well. Yes, exactly. There, you know, More and more people tuning into today's show talking about Hi-Fi Rush PS5 review roundup. We will be checking out Hi-Fi Rush PS5 gameplay today in like an hour and a half. Okay? So if you're wanting to see how it played, I got through the opening tutorial so you can just kind of see the game as it is. It's great. It's a great port. I've had no issues. The haptic feedback and the speaker and the controller and the uh, it it really it really is good. It is. Um and I praised it last year. You can't find me out here saying it's a bad game, it's a lame game. I've had nothing but praise for that game and uh my daughter loved it and she was very excited. I told her last night. I said Guess what game I'm covering tomorrow? Uh, Patrick Q gifts a member. Thank you so much. And it goes to Stephanie. Good to see you, Stephanie. Hope you're here today. And that's not just sending the email. Always like when folks are here when they get those gifted members. What's the review core, uh, score on the PlayStation Store? Let me pull it up right now uh, and see. It was five stars, but it had only been reviewed 11 times when I checked last night. It had only The game had only been live to be played for a couple of hours when I checked. So it had five, five out of five stars. I don't know if you agree with me, but it comes down to Xbox fanboys. They simply do not buy games. They are not good gamers for the business. They support a Game Pass too much. Now, Rich Rod, I'm going to push back on what you're saying. The, The gamers didn't do anything wrong. They responded to a value proposition. If if you went if you went to a local restaurant and the and the owner was like, "Hey, I tell you what. I'll let you come in here and eat anything off the menu any time that you want. You just have to pay this monthly fee." Yeah, it still only is showing 11 reviews, uh 11 ratings and it has a it has a 5-star rating. Um I'm going to rate it. I'm going to give it 5. <laughs> I'm going to give it a 5-star rating. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If you actually go into it, hang on, let me show you. If you actually go into the settings, um, oh, that's window capture. That's video capture. Why is my video, my capture card is once again not working? Come on, man. I don't know what's going on with, um, so there's my desktop. Yeah, it's not, it's not turning on. I ran into this problem the other day. I it's really really frustrating. I'll have to fiddle with it before we do gameplay. I don't know what's going on. It might be it might be the USB um, ports on the front of my computer are going bad or something. It keeps losing the I don't want to mess with it cuz it'll it'll mess up OBS. So I'll have to fiddle with it whenever we go to do the second stream. 
but it currently has 378 ratings um and it's got a 4.96 so it's it's doing pretty well it's off to a great start you know almost 400 ratings and it has almost a perfect score so i am not surprised like at all that doesn't surprise me in the least it's a great game doc's grave will say death by xbox tax I, there's no evidence of an xbox tax like i i just think that's just such a bogus thing to claim i, I really do it's like come on man that there's no evidence of an xbox tax there just isn't um you know it's like th- there's only eight reviews on metacritic hi-fi metacritic let's go to the metacritic and see if it's updated at all and it's only a four point difference are you seriously going to say a four point difference is y- you're seriously going to say that this is an xbox tax 63 reviews this is a great score by the way this is a really really strong score anything close to or around 90 is a great score for for a game like hi-fi rush this is very respectable this is a four point lead and there's only eight reviews like you're come on man look up pentiment okay is it less reviews though that's always going to be the problem that's always going to be the problem pentiment metacritic let's see all right let's take a peek here um okay here we go 86 on the series x 88 on pc right Xbox tax, two whole points. You know what you know what the common denominator is here? Look, less reviews. All right, let's scroll down here. Only five reviews on Switch, and it's got a 93, and the PS5 only has four reviews, and it's an 87. So there's a one-point difference. There's a one-point difference for Pentiment between the PlayStation and the Xbox. Come on, man. Come on. It's always going to be easier to maintain a higher score when you have less reviews. You know, eight whole people have reviewed it on Metacritic. Like, let's check on it in a couple of days. And I'll be honest with you, I actually wouldn't be surprised if a lot of outlets don't do a Hi-Fi Rush PS5 review. Because the demand might not be very high. They're like, we already wrote a review, right? What are we What are we going to say here, you know? What, what's, what's to be said that we haven't said, you know? 11 total reviews on the PlayStation Store. No, Corey, if you go to, into the, like, leave your own review, there's almost 400 reviews of Hi-Fi Rush on the PlayStation. It has a 4.96. So, Xbox tax clear as day. <laughs> yeah, Baldur's Gate 3 has a better score on Xbox. Do you want to know why? It only has 10 reviews versus the 118 reviews on PC and the 39 reviews on PS5. Isn't that interesting that Baldur's Gate 3 somehow has a better score on Metacritic, you know, than it does on the other platforms? Because it has less reviews! Like, who do you think is most likely going to review Baldur's Gate 3 on the Xbox Series X, right? Who? Game's already out, it's already been reviewed, people have already read about it. So who do you think is the most likely candidate to review that game when it hits its third platform? Somebody who's already a fan. So they're probably way more likely to give it a good score. Same could be said for Hi-Fi Rush. The people that are going to be willing to give Hi-Fi Rush a PS5 review, they're probably already fans of the game. And they're like, okay, it's great. And the haptic feedback makes it a little bit better. So it, you know, the score goes up a teeny bit. You know, if the Xbox tax is real, then you'd be able to demonstrate it with other games. And you can't, because when you go to Baldur's Gate 3, the same mathematical axiom reigns true. Less reviews makes it easier to have a higher score. Especially when it's less reviews because the game came later. Like, think about that. That's just so obvious, you know? You guarantee that Ori, Starfield, and Gears are all on the way? I would love for Ori to be on the PlayStation. Oh my gosh. I love Ori. Both both the first in, in game and the second game. 
If the Xbox fan base supported games, these games wouldn't be on PlayStation. Xbox methodology along with the fan base only wanting Game Pass games killed Xbox. Right, but here's why I don't think it's fair to blame the consumer, Rich Rod. Xbox made a value prep uh, proposition. It's a really good value proposition. Let me go back to my analogy because I interrupted myself when I was answering you earlier because I got caught up into the review score thing and my capture card was acting up. If, if a local restaurant let you do the same thing and they were like, yeah, no, you can come eat as anything off the menu you know, once, once a day and you only got to pay us you know, 15 bucks a month and you're like, that sounds incredible. And then a year later, the guy's closing up shop and he's like, yeah, all you freaking people, you all took advantage of the amazing value proposition that I put out there and nobody was buying the food. So I was losing money. But that would be the dumbest thing. It, what? What do you mean? It's our fault. You're the one that offered it. Xbox offered an amazing value proposition and they fostered that culture they fostered a culture of people that are like I'll wait to play it on Game Pass I don't need to buy a game I'm feasting over here on Game Pass why would you not do that I can't blame the consumer I can't now I always said there's a real danger with Game Pass there's shorts out there there's real quick videos of me saying that I think Game Pass could be bad for the industry could be bad for Xbox (laughs) and look where we are it was value destructive it fostered a culture of non-purchase and everybody always told me that I was wrong not everybody but a lot of those Xbox loyal guys would be like you're wrong why? because Phil Spencer said Xbox actually increases sales you know he did in that one interview about Forza he said yeah word of mouth you know Game Pass actually increases the sales of games and people always told me that they're like no you're wrong it's not fostering an ecosystem or a culture of non-purchase it's actually increasing purchases and we had weird stats about how like well people on Game Pass annually spend more money well okay that's not surprising they're engaged they're spending money they're picking up a a subscription service so of course they're going to be spending more money annually they're a more engaged player I would argue that the value proposition of Game Pass was a reaction to the fact that gamers didn't buy the games. The cause of the issue began with the consumer. Microsoft reacted and the reaction was wrong. I don't see evidence that Microsoft reacted to consumers not willing to buy games. Do we need to go back and look at how well some of their games did? I mean, didn't they have great sales of games like Halo in the past? Where is there evidence that Xbox consumers weren't buying games? Rich Rod agrees with me. He says with a $2 super chat, see last message. I agree, Lono. It's a great deal, but the fan base took that and ran with it. They now refuse to buy games. That's on them. I'd take the free food, but I would also occasionally buy gourmet food. Sorry, Lono, but I have to disagree. The Xbox fan base is to blame, not because they were playing games through Game Pass, but because they started demanding all games go into Game Pass. You guys are disagreeing with me. Okay, let me try and listen to your position on this. So you're basically, I don't agree with Corey's assertion that Xbox was responding to a user base that wasn't buying games. I don't think there's evidence to support that. I think traditionally during the 360 era, you can point to games selling very well. I don't think they had consumers that were like, I refuse to buy games. I don't think that that's, I don't think that's accurate. Okay. But now you guys are saying they, it it morphed, it morphed into, and I always said this little shop of horrors, right? Feed me, feed me. Like that's what this turned the user into, into a monster that, that was like, no, everything must be on game pass. Okay. Let me consider that for a moment. I don't think you're incorrect in saying that consumers suddenly expected Game Pass to be the primary means of which they got games, which then expedited the problem. I still have a very hard time. (laughs) I still have a very hard time blaming them for that evolution. When Game Pass is the centerpiece of all the marketing, play it day one on Game Pass. Game Pass. Game Pass. Play it day one on Game Pass. Okay, you, they Xbox set that expectation. 
So you're like, Hi-Fi Rush is coming to PlayStation 5 because the users didn't buy it. The, the users expected everything to be on Game Pass. Why wouldn't they? It's how Xbox marketed everything. The lack of console sales is the impetus, says Eugene. The consumer didn't sell a box with a one-third fail rate. The consumer didn't market the Xbox One and sell a weaker box for a higher price. The consumer didn't make all the mistakes that led Microsoft to this. I agree with Eugene. Xbox's mistakes and failures are their own. You want to turn around and very unidimensionally be like, well, consumers weren't buying enough games. Oh, come on. That, 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 that's not the only thing that happened here. Hi-Fi Rush coming to PlayStation 5 and also probably arguably being the definitive edition of the game with the haptic feedback and the triggers and the controller speaker. It's got more features for crying out loud. That's all on Microsoft. That's on Xbox. That's not on the users. Xbox didn't innovate on the controller. PlayStation did. Then you had Xbox talking heads calling it a gimmick and calling it a joke. Get at well, Okay, it's not. It clearly isn't. There are people reviewing the game that are like, I loved Hi-Fi Rush, but this, uh, this adds to the experience. That doesn't sound like a pony to me. That sounds like somebody who already liked hi-fi rush and they're like yeah this 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 takes it up a notch but it's a gimmick right like that's on xbox they didn't innovate on their controller they just here's another xbox controller and here's 25 more in different colors there's not enough for games because they don't sell enough boxes yeah, Sven is that guy. Sven said he woke up, he, he was going to wake up this morning ready to tell me it's not the definitive version, Lono. That's that's a pony talking point. And Sven's like, nope, I played it on Xbox. It's better on the PlayStation 5. Like, I'm telling you, that's that's like a blow. And you can't blame that on the consumer. What did Derek say? Hang on a minute. Derek says, right on, and a huge percentage of their players bought it hook, line, and sinker. There's a reason we joke about Xbox guys saying four things. Mid, trash, game of the year, Game Pass. (laughs) Game Pass makes me feel like I need to buy games. I don't need to buy games for Xbox anymore. People are mad Sony has a better version of their game using Sony's features. The irony. I love adaptive triggers, but I w- I love adaptive triggers, but I wish the resistance was higher when it was active. The, the adaptive triggers when they're highly resistant, I hate that. I like when it's slightly resistant, like in Horizon Forbidden West, but in like Hitman Three, where like it literally stops you and you have to pull through, almost like a click. I do not like that. That's my least favorite feature of the controller. Everyone talked about Rise, Son of Rome. How many sales does the game have? Oh, I don't even know. I wasn't covering that back then. I don't remember. I remember thinking Rise was pretty awesome, though. Steven Marsing setting up the 20-bomb dunker. 5 out of 25. Some of the big boys like to wait in the shadows. Guys, if we get 100 members today, I'll gift the 20 that I owe, and we'll hit the goal of 2,500, securing a community game night for next week. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for doing that, Steven Marsden. I hate the adaptive triggers. I always feel like they're broken and and break them. Yeah, I don't like the, the adaptive triggers. I like the haptic feedback. I love the touchpad, and I love the speaker. Everything out the, the adaptive triggers I turn off a lot of the times. I turned off my adaptive triggers in my PSVR 2 because in Synapse... It was making me miss shots. Like, that extra pull, like, just that little vibration of having to pull through it, right? Like, I would move the controller, like, a hair's breadth, and I'd miss shots. As soon as I turned it off, I was hitting more shots. I was like, that's not adding to the immersion. I'm not trying to shoot a real gun. (laughs) Like, squeeze the trigger, Lono. Squeeze. Don't pull. Like, get the frick out of here. It's a video game. (laughs) I'm not trying to play with a real weapon. You know, now I, I will say that's a great opportunity maybe for like a PSVR 2, you know, um, you know, uh, shooting simulator or something to make it feel, you know, all the different, you know, trigger pulls of all the different weapons that are out there and maybe adding some haptic feedback or it'd be really cool if they could add kick in a controller like that'd be really neat. You'd almost need like a mechanism to go back on the arm with almost like a, um, some type of a string to pull to pull back. 
you know can you imagine something that you kind of wore here that interacted with the controller when you shot the weapon it would pull b- oh man that'd be f- <laughs> that'd be cool i might have just patented something awesome back in the 360 days i gifted a mate of mine an xbox for his birthday now he has a ps5 just because he loves gran turismo 7 and no game pass can change that anecdotal but still a fact well you know games will certainly convince people where they would like to play um but I do but I do think I do think Game Pass was a strong, you know, uh value offer. But I do think the dilemma that came from Game Pass wasn't just people that were like, "Hey, I don't want to buy games or I'm waiting for it to um I'm waiting for it to come to Game Pass." You know, all those cliché things that we we have heard um Hang on a second. I'm gonna text. Uh, I'm a text creature. Uh, wake up. Um, <laughs> I don't know where he is. He's a wake up. Like, are you sending the tweet? Are we putting shorts out? What's going on, creature? This man's sleeping on me today. Um, I had to. I sent my own tweet. Sent my own tweet. Or did he get up? Did he get up and send one? No, he didn't. Okay. He might still. He might still be asleep or something. Maybe he's under the weather. <laughs> Um, you might have just lost a patent to something. Yeah, I just gave that away for free. Um, and a five bomb comes in from Rock and Robin, taking us halfway to the 25. 10 out of the 25. Well, almost halfway to the 25. Thank you so much, Rock and Robin. If we hit 100 members a day, I'll give the 20 that I owe, and we'll hit the goal for the week. Thank you so much, Rock and Robin. Game Pass was an attempt to sell more consoles, and it failed to do that. That is all. That is why games are coming to PlayStation. They haven't sold enough consoles. Returnal is the only game I ever liked. The haptics and the adaptive triggers. Um, every other game, I turn it off. Yo, good morning, feed. Yeah, for Returnal, I switched the control scheme entirely. I put alt fire on the bumper. I would always use my alt fire by mistake. So I switched it. Zintho says, I'm hoping this leak, he's talking in the members only Discord, which is something you guys should take advantage of if you're a member or if you're not a member. Make sure and click the join button, click the $6 member tier, and get in our members only Discord. A great place to connect with people, play hell divers with people. He's got a screenshot in here in the members only Discord. He says, I hope this leak is true that they make an Elite Controller Series 3 with haptics. It's going to be funny seeing the haters suddenly love that feature. Listen, I wouldn't be surprised if, if a lot of Xbox guys, you know, start playing on PlayStation or get a PlayStation 5 and they play something like Hi Fi Rush. I wouldn't be surprised if you see a lot of them say, I, I was wrong about haptics. Right, I I I under th- I undersold it. I thought that sounds like a gimmick to me, and then I played a couple games, and I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, this is awesome. That's inaccurate by a lot. What's inaccurate? What are you responding to, Bold Alpha Wolf? Rich Rod says, Lono, they don't want to buy games though. They'd rather trash great games not on Game Pass than buy or play them. Xbox fan base has become overwhelmingly toxic. Listen, listen. This is day this is day seventeen of calling Doc Dark out on his slander of Ori. Okay. The Ori slander will not stand. That man said they should humble themselves, right? They 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 should be in the sales bin. Like they're not worthy of being purchased, and they sh- you know they should be on Game Pass. That's an award winning, you know, media darling game. You know, Xbox named it uh, the Xbox Game of the Year the year it came out. His slander of Ori will not stand. There is an element to what you're saying that I do think is true. That they started to act like, oh yeah, you know, the game should be on Game Pass. If they're not, that's you know they they would reject it. They they would be against it right so i do think there is an aspect of that but i again i don't think that represents the fan base at large here's the thing this this is how i'm gonna say it i think there are the, the, the general public i think the general public did what was made sense to them they subscribe to game pass and they never lack for games ever I remember my my brother signing up for Game Pass for his sons because there's always something for them to play. Always. So, what do you think they probably did after that? They bought less games. It's like, if you... He's got three sons. You think he wants to buy every game they want to play? You know what I mean? You, you dads out there, you know what this is like. I think the average consumer just said... No, we, we have Game Pass. That's where you can play. That's what games you can get. You know, or I or I have Game Pass. Why would I buy a game? 
I have this amazing backlog of games. I'm getting games every single month. Why would I buy games? Think about it from this perspective. We know from the research that the average person buys one to three games a year. If you get a batch of games every month and one of them is is good enough for you to kind of play it and enjoy it, 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 you, you, you're well ahead of the curve. You're well ahead of the curve. You're, you're going to be playing roughly, probably somewhere between 9 and 10 games a year. M- not to completion. Let's say they complete about half of those, you know, 4 or 5. I think that's what the average consumer did. Why would they not? It's a great deal. I've always said it's one of the greatest values in gaming. That's not all I said, but I was like, that's it's probably the best value in gaming. Why would you not do it? Helt, uh, Heltic Silver, thank you so much for renewing your membership. Welcome back. I feel a lot of parents do that with Game Pass just for the kids to play different games without having to buy a bunch of full price. Oh, for sure. It's fun. It's phenomenal. Imagine the money I would have to spend for my kids to be able to consume all the Pokemon shows on Netflix that they like to watch and all the Bluey episodes that they like to watch and every single Disney movie that they decide to watch like on the weekend with their friends or like if it's a movie night or something. Like, imagine the money I'd have to spend to own all those. Now you're like, well, but you're spending that annually in the subscription. Well, that's why you pick and choose what sub-services you want, and then you cancel them. You don't keep them all. Or you go to cancel them, and they, they try to keep you, and you get something for like three bucks a month. Like, I got Paramount for three bucks a month, and Peacock for like two bucks a month. Just go threaten to cancel. Go through the cancellation progress uh, process on any of your subscription services. And they'll be like, well, will you stay for this much? Just like literally do that every time the deal expires. Just do that. <laughs> Ori's a masterpiece, in my opinion. It's Xbox's best game. I'll happily buy it again. Don't forget the three or four games you get on the first and like the 15th of the month. Mm hmm. Super Metroid literally brought me back from gamers' depression. And now people think it's somehow a cheap genre. That's why I always said the Series S is fantastic for kids. Yeah, see, I think the issue becomes, though, you what, what you're doing when you do that is you're carving out an audience that is racing you to the bottom. Do you get that? Like, you gave them a console at, at the cheapest price in the market. You're giving them the cheapest price the cheapest spend annual to get tons of games and so what you're doing is is you're racing the consumer to the bottom you're basically training them to think and I'm telling you this is what is at the heart of so much of the games are so expensive they shouldn't raise the price this is such a rip off where do you think that comes from you have mentally raced your consumers to the bottom they think gaming is cheap they think it's a, like, oh, this is, a th- this is throwaway. This is cheap. That's why publishers and developers are like, that's value destructive. What are you doing? Graphic designers face this all the time. They face this all the time. So back when I was regularly needing to upgrade uh, and buy emotes, okay, I would always pay my emote artist what he asked for, and then I would tip him. I would basically double. Like, if I owed him 150, I'd tip him another 150. I'm like, you don't charge enough. You're the best. He is still to this date the best emote artist in the business. And he undersells himself. Why? Because the market of graphic designers got oversaturated and it was a race to the bottom because all these big Twitch streamers are cheap. They're cheap, right? They'll have contests for their logos or contests for their merch design. Why? Because they don't want to hire an artist and pay them what they're worth. So the work of graphic designers was collectively devalued and it becomes a race to the bottom. So the only way for him to get customers is to charge basically what everybody else is charging. You gotta gotta devalue your product. You gotta race to the bottom. So here's the thing. If you have a consumer base that you have then taken and raced them to the bottom, lowest console price in the market, 
lowest outgo required to play games. What have you done? You've devalued gaming in all of their minds. They're like, gaming is cheap. Why? $70 for a game? What? Like, that doesn't even compute because you've raced them to the bottom mentally. They're like, gaming is cheap. Why would I buy a game? Why would you raise the price? Then you look at the budgets of the games. You look at the timeline of the games and how long it takes for production. It's like, these games are incredibly expensive. What are you talking about? They're not cheap at all. You're not consuming a a, a cheeseburger from a fast food restaurant. This is four and five, sometimes six years of blood, sweat, and tears. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of thousands of employees have touched this game. And you're like, eh, put it on Game Pass or I'm not interested. That you, you want to blame the consumer, but it's like what you, what they did psychologically to that culture and that that subsector of the consumer base is they race them to the bottom. And when you and when there's a race to the bottom, whatever the product is has been devalued. Now I went through this when I ran my own graphic design business. I just in I just increased my rates. I was only charging like twenty five dollars an hour, and I met with a marketing guy, and he's like, "You you need to double or triple your rates tomorrow." He's like, "You'll get better customers." You'll get better customers. He's like, do you really want to work for the guy that is, you know, penny pinching on his budget? He, he's going to try and get extra iterations out of you for free. He's going to try and get extra work out of you for free. But a guy who's going to pay you $75 to $100 an hour, he's paying you what you're worth. He understands the value that you bring. That's a better customer. So I, I, I don't accept blaming the consumer. The consumer played a role in this evolution of Xbox. Hi-Fi Rush landing on PlayStation 5 is like, I, I, well, I think it was Tim Dog who tweeted it. He was like, the end of an era. He's not wrong. He, he's not wrong. It's the end of an era. There's no more E3 face-off. There's no more laundry list of game face-off. That's gone. That's over. Every game has an asterisk next to it. So it could come. We could be day and date. We don't know. Blade's probably going to be day and date on all platforms. PC, PlayStation, Xbox. I, I, I'm, I'm more confident of that than anything out of the list of games is that Blade is multi-plat. They saw Game Pass and personally chose to run with it. They don't want to buy games. They played a major role. The consumer will take the path of least resistance, Rich Rod. If a commercial hit the airwaves right now and said, come to Best Buy, all HD TVs are $100. It doesn't matter the size. It doesn't matter the brand. It doesn't matter the feature set. Every, every television in our store is $100. What would happen? Chaos would happen. People be running each other over in the parking lot. They'd be clawing each other's eyes out. I saw the TV first. And you're like, well, that's the consumer's fault. It's what the consumer's been trained to do. Chase the best deal. Chase the best value proposition. It's what they're, it's what they're going to do. They're going to go. That's why, that's why the Black Friday sales are crazy. Yeah, Trill's there. Trill's there. He's ready. He's, he's getting, he's getting himself a couple TVs. Kel Swiss with 14 months in a VIP. Xbox purposely poisoned the well in order to cultivate a culture where paying full price for games was bad and where it was better to sub for games. Guess who's running a sub service for their games? Well. Well, now, and, well, yeah, now, now they're, they're trying to push the idea of um, you know, exclusives are bad. That one, too. I don't fault the consumer. The consumer's on the dance floor, okay? They played a part, but Xbox was leading the dance routine. Xbox was leading the dance routine, and they followed. The consumer followed. What what would you expect them to do? Let's play it out differently. You just noticed the t-shirt? Yeah, this is another one. I this I really love the detail work in this one, right? And the colors just... The print quality from Into the AM is phenomenal. Anytime they're having a sale over there, guys, use my code. My code stacks on top. 
code Lono or go to intotheam.com slash Lono and that, that supports me and you guys get a great deal. Let, let's play this out. The newest talking point is that the Series S is the cheapest entry for GTA 6. What? <laughs> we'll see how that... <laughs> <clears throat> I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm sorry. I'm 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 supposed to be nice. I'm trying to be nice, but that's laughable. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how that goes, dude. <laughs> if that's what people think, people are going to be looking for with GTA Six. All right. I heard the same thing going into this gen that the Series S was the cheapest route to next gen gaming and uh, didn't seem to matter. Didn't seem to move the hardware needle. If you think GTA 6, people are going to say, well, I want the cheapest way to play that game. I think that's a huge misread of the consumer base. I don't think that that's accurate at all. I'm open to being wrong. But it didn't play out for the last four years. I don't think GTA 6 is going to change that. It was the cheapest way to get into next-gen gaming. Street Shadow with a $5 Super Chat tip. People should think about this. If you put Xbox into the Sony or Nintendo market position, you shouldn't... You wouldn't have ever seen Game Pass. Alone in the Dark reviews. Oh gosh, they're bad. What happened? Is that that's the remake or oh, I'm sorry, the the remaster is it not? That's really bad. It's getting horrible scores. It's getting like sevens and eights are the highest. Everything else is sixes and fives and fours and threes. Good night. Um even Destin said he doesn't think GTA 6 will work for Xbox if they don't have a PS Pro competitor. Well, they're not going to have a pro competitor. They're not in the market for it. They don't care to do it. It's a remake reboot. I don't think it's a reboot. It's the same it's the same characters and scenes, is it not? I don't think it's a reboot. I just thought it was like a remaster, like they made it look prettier. Or am I thinking of something else? David Harbour's in that? What am I thinking of? I'm thinking of the other one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm thinking of the other one. I'm thinking of the dark... Um, what's the dark anthology game that's getting redone? Um, uh, Until Dawn. Am I thinking of Until Dawn? I think I'm confusing my games here. There's a, there's a That's the one with Hayden Penetieri in it, or however you say her last name. That hasn't come out. That's got Rami Malek in it. That game hasn't come out yet, right? I saw Alone in the Dark, and that was the game I thought of. I think I've confused myself. Um, what were we talking about? We were talking about consumer expectations. We were talking about, oh, GTA 6. Before you made the remark about GTA 6, oh, Street Shadow. I want to respond to what Street Shadow said. Yeah, if Xbox had a dominant position, I don't think they would have rolled out Game Pass. I don't think they would have. Smile with your teeth. That's right. Smile with your teeth. That's one of my, that's one of my favorite jokes I've ever told. Um, Oh, that's right. Until Dawn is a remake. I, I confuse myself. Okay, I want to go back to what I was going to say to Rich Rod and the others who are blaming the consumers. L- let's imagine another reality where the consumers took a, a, a noble approach and said, we will not support Game Pass or we will buy games anyway. I, that's That just sounds like a fantasy to me, dude. That sounds like a fantasy to me. I I don't see that happening. This man, this man must be asleep. He crashed and he doesn't realize that it's it's 11, it's 11 in the morning. Preacher needs to wake up. We got videos that need to go out. <clears throat> Yo, it's C. Lou with 11 months of membership. Welcome back. If Xbox dominated, Sony would have pioneered Game Pass. 
No, I don't think it's that simplistic. I don't think it's like if Xbox were dominating, then Sony would have done Game Pass. I think there would have been different responses. Xbox has something cooking? No, they don't. That dev kit that's been raided in South Korea is a digital Series X, Hadigan. You guys have got to read the articles instead of just looking at the headlines. Like, read the article. Come on, man. Take two se- Take two minutes and actually read the article. New Xbox dev kit raided in South Korea. Okay? Keep reading. <laughs> it's just a digital Series X. <laughs> oh, man. Insider Gaming knows what they're doing. I got respect. I got respect. They're playing the game. They know people are going to read that headline and they're going to click and be like, oh, Xbox has got something. Mm hmm. Yeah, a digital Series X that no one asked for. If you want to understand my thoughts, I responded, but you missed it. All right, hang on, Corey. Let me read what you said. Let me read what Corey said here. Corey said, I maintain that late 360 and early Xbox One low game sales triggered Microsoft to create Game Pass as a way to monetize their consumer base who would use games for list wars but wouldn't actually buy them. If you look at the sales of games for the Xbox One launch and consider that the launch lineup of games is largely considered better than the PS4 launch lineup, I think it cannot be ignored that the Xbox gamer used a lot of games to list wars but didn't actually purchase them. Corey, I'm not equipped to refute what you're saying because I'd have to go back and re- research how games sold for the Xbox One. I think the Xbox One is unfair to point to. I'm just going to armchair this real quick and try and, and try and put together a rebuttal. I think the Xbox One is really tough to use as evidence because its launch was terrible. The reception of the Xbox One was bad. You had customers feeling like they were getting ripped off. You had customers feeling like, what the frick is this? Like, go watch King Thrash's documentary part one on how that era play, like played out. They were focused on TV, 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 TV. All of the push was for like how they could implement advertisement into the home experience. Like they had deprioritized gaming so much in their presentation of the Xbox One. I don't think it's fair to be like, oh, well, the consumers just stopped buying all of the sudden for no reason. It didn't happen in a vacuum. If there was a decrease in game sales during the Xbox One era, Microsoft manufactured that. Xbox manufactured that go back go back and look at how they they fumbled they fumbled the Xbox One launch the marketing and and, and the price and all it was atrocious it was so bad they had Jeff Keighley try to help them with the announcement to like cushion the blow of the negativity we learned about that from Tim Dog. <clears throat> The Xbox One was so bad. So if there was a decrease in game sales during the Xbox One era, again, I'm not going to look at the consumer and be like, yep, they just stopped buying games. They just suddenly went cheap on Xbox. So Xbox had to do Game Pass. I don't I don't agree with that timeline. <clears throat> I don't. Xbox One almost killed them completely. Phil had to talk Microsoft into staying in the gaming business. Yeah, it was far more com- complex than just the consumers stopped buying games. I- I'm not buying into the mentality that we blame the consumers for any of this. Rich Rob with the 10 spot. My issue is them complaining. If I buy cheap Chinese tech that breaks after a month, is it my fault or the tech company? They get mad that the name brand isn't as cheap. That's the Game Pass consumer mindset. Here's the problem with that. I don't know if the user base at large from Xbox has this sort of entitled idea that everything should be cheap and everything should be like low standard. Their shareholders had just almost successfully forced Microsoft to sell Xbox. Right, like Xbox was on the brink at that point and I don't think it's because the consumer just suddenly decided like oh I don't want to buy games there was a lack of confidence in the brand 
That's the generation they lost. And as Phil said, it was the worst generation to lose because that's when people were building their digital libraries. So if you think about that aspect, it's not that the consumer suddenly decided, oh, I'm going to become a cheapskate and I don't want to buy games. It was, they didn't have confidence in the brand. The 360 era had high fail rates, red ring of death. So you had you had that element kind of as a shadow hanging over the brand as it was. And when the Xbox One was supposed to ride in like a steed and rescue consumer confidence from the pit that it was in, it made it worse. The low game sales actually began with the late 360 era and continued to the Xbox One. Right, and that could be related to hardware failure though. Eugene says Game Pass likely saved Xbox. It's hard not to see that it probably did. It kept him in the fight. Like, I got mad respect for Phil Spencer. Like, I called him out on his doublespeak. I've called him out on the manipulation that they pulled with that Xbox podcast. I don't think they're shooting straight with the consumer. And guys like Tim Dog and others are, are awake to the reality that it was a bunch of doublespeak corpo nonsense. I've called him out on that. But I've given him his flowers. That man kept Xbox in the fight. If it weren't for Phil Spencer, we'd be living in a completely different reality today. Xbox would be a distant memory like the Dreamcast. That man kept Xbox in the fight. Game Pass likely playing a large role of keeping them in the fight. But it wasn't enough. They, they had already slipped so far down the hill. It was like, you're, you're, they were literally just spinning their tires, like maintaining their position. Maybe making a little bit of headway. No, so I, 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 I don't, again, I don't buy into this idea. I don't buy into this idea that we can blame the consumer. It's, oh, it's their fault. I know that plays well on, uh, on Twitter. You want to throw it in someone's face and be like, well, y'all don't buy games and now you're angry that Xbox is deciding to sell them. Like, okay, you know, it makes for good Twitter tennis matches, but it's not really, I don't think, what the average consumer did or concluded. The average consumer chased a good deal. They chased a good deal. Xbox put the deal out there. The consumer cannot be blamed for taking it. I'm not saying Microsoft is blameless for the situation, but the consumer is also very much on the hook for the situation. Uh, I have said it this way. They're both on the dance floor, Corey. But Xbox was leading the dance routine. If you're like, that was a bad dance routine, you would primarily go to the guy that choreographed it and that led the dance routine. You'd be like, that was not a good dance routine. Now, you could go to the dancer and say, you also didn't do the greatest job, right? You made some mistakes in there. You had some missteps. But largely, you would put the weight of the blame on the person, the architect, the person who came up with the dance routine, the person who led the dance routine. You'd be like, it was you. There's two dancers on the dance floor, but you would still primarily place blame on the guy that came up with all the moves and led everybody through it. That I mean, that to me is just the hierarchy here of blame. I feel that Xbox made mistakes and I don't think there was there were quick there were no quick fixes for the mistakes that took place there were not I'm telling you that thrash documentary is incredibly helpful in seeing Microsoft saw statistics about gaming and entertainment and they saw this convergence that didn't come to fruition they really truly thought that they had built an all-in-one home entertainment system. They really thought they had it. And the th- and oh man, the sad thing about it is, at some level, they were right. Because if you look at smart TVs, it's quite literally what the Xbox One tried to be. It's like they were ahead of the curve so much that they were crushed by it. Like they were too, they were so early to market with a concept and an idea that it just didn't go anywhere. Like people were, nobody thought, oh, I'm going to have my entertainment system be a, be an, be, be a gaming console. And even if it would have started to get momentum, I think smart TVs would have really made it tough for them to maintain that identity. Oh, it's just easier just to buy a TV. 
My TV has all my apps. My TV has games. My TV has everything that I need. I don't need that anymore. Alapark says the consumer has the mindset of being frugal with Xbox because Xbox hasn't earned the reputation of being worth the money. Game Pass allowed them to hang on to a fan base that was already pulling away because they weren't seeing the value of what was being offered. If it's not the consumer's fault for taking advantage of a deal, it's Xbox's fault for not offering something that was deemed worthy of their customers' dollars. I think that's I think that's so well stated. I think that's so well stated. I remember I heard somebody make this analysis once. They said Xbox knows their games are not of the quality where they could charge full price for them. They have, they're, they're basically Game Pass games. And I know that sounds like pony hate, but if you really think about it, if you really think about the quality of Xbox games over the years, this is where the myth of the Xbox tax comes from. This would be like being a really, really bad sports dynasty for 20 years and claiming there's a tax against you in, in the press. When all the press is doing is is reporting on your bad games and your and your loss record. Yeah, there's a tax out there against us. You're two and ten. Shut up. Shut up. Hey, come on. Nobody would buy that. Imagine some sports guy doing an interview. You know, I really just think there's a tax against us in the gaming in, uh, in the in the sports press. You're two and ten. Shut up. You nobody would buy that. The Xbox tax, all you're doing is is pointing to a history of games that don't score as well. Games that don't get the same critical reception. That, what do you, what, that's not a tax. Why would, it, why would American-owned outlets have a, have, a, have a tax against an American-owned company? If anything, they would want to play nice with Microsoft. Microsoft's a powerful company. Do, do we need to go back and talk about how Xbox paid influencers to promote the Xbox One and say it was great and they didn't divulge that they were paid? That was the beginning of the Xbox astrotur- astroturfing efforts to basically mislead the public? Like, that was the beginning of it. They got caught literally using giant YouTubers to promote the Xbox One and it wasn't divulged to the public. I've been doing this for a very, very long time. This There's nothing new. Quality has been horrible for Xbox over the past few years, and they treat their top IPs very badly. Right, like if you really listen to people who who sing Xbox's praises, they keep having to go further and further and further back. Nobody's going to turn around and talk about 2022 or 2023. You, you can brag about Starfield all you want. The consumer reception of Starfield is plainly seen in the review scores. You you, you got to run them. You got to run to like Metacritic. Right? This man just woke up. <laughs> Creature just woke up. <laughs> He's like, I certainly think you should. Power was out, phone was dead. Oh, okay, okay, his phone was dead. Okay, so that's why he overslept. No worries. Wow, they did that? Yes. I have my own theory that when Xbox got caught during that, during the Xbox One era, they pivoted strategy. So instead of having people promote something and not say that they had promoted it, because now there's literal, like, federal law about that, they have now switched their strategy to, they they reached out to smaller creators and they give them information because information is infinitely more valuable to a small creator. A big creator is not going to care. A guy with a hundred thousand or a million subscribers or whatever, like really, really big creators are like, I don't care about your press releases and your information. I, I need access to games. I need access to, you know, review copies or the hardware early. And so I think they started using smaller creators to be their astroturfing mouthpieces to basic because that's good for them right a lot of these guys have literally built careers basically being pr for xbox because i think xbox pivoted the xbox got you know caught sticking their hand in the cookie jar and so instead of them doing that they're like coaxing somebody else to do it like because again information's very very valuable like when you're a smaller creator and you can sort of have 
the inside scoop on what's coming you can build a brand on that there are guys that have done this with destiny there are there are there are guys who write for outlets that do this uh for bungie they don't divulge their relationship it's very unethical but there's no law against it so they're going to do it they're not they're not actually breaking a law it's just isn't ethical they don't divulge their relationship because it's conflict of interest so that's why a lot of these guys are always in defense of the brand because they're in the pocket of the brand essentially and information is a currency these days when you scoop a story when you scoop a story that's money when you know what's coming that's money that's as good as them writing a check Yo, Lotus Esprit, thank you so much for the $5 Super Chat tip. So I I think that's what we've seen. If you go back in time, the Xbox One era, when they got caught doing that, ever since it's been, well, we'll use other, we'll we'll use smaller creators and kind of like, I hate that word, but almost like groom them to raise up and be mouthpieces for us. Well, that works with them because they're not an established creator yet. A really big creator ain't going to play that game. They're like, I'm not going to be a PR mouthpiece for you. I don't, they don't need to. They're established. They're a giant creator. You try to approach some big influencer like that, they're going to tell you to kick rocks. They want money. Any plans to cover the alleged bungee leak that Astro Cross posted a vid for? I mean, everything I heard Cross say sounds like it tracks with everything I've heard about that company. It sounds right on the nose, but... It's just an anonymous email, so there's no way to know. Everyone has a price. Like, look at the people who built platforms stumping for Xbox, okay? Where were they? Where were they a couple of years ago? Who were they four or five years ago? Do it. Track the history of it. It's easy to see. It's super easy to see. That, that, that's why when you go to major creators, like really big creators, they'll be critical of Xbox or they'll say something about Xbox and they'll get called a pony and they're like, what are you talking about? Like, they're not in this this world and in this fight. The people that are, they built their platform doing it. And that's why they were out there saying that that's what I was doing. They're like, oh, he's just a pony. He's just a grifter. He's just building a channel hating on Xbox, which is unsubstantiated. You can't go to my content and see proof of that. My best performing content is actually usually covering both both platforms, not one, not, not hating on one. If you try to build a channel hating on one platform, you can't then also praise it and cover their live events and stream their games. Nobody wants to freaking see that. Go to a channel that primarily covers Xbox. Are they out here pr- praising and playing PlayStation games? Go to co- go to p- channels that primarily cover PlayStation and hate on Xbox. Are they out here praising Xbox, covering Xbox live events? Are they out here, you know, playing Xbox games? Typically, no, they don't because their 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 audience won't respond to it. So you have to see like the trajectory of some of these channels that's why they always project that onto everybody else it's the way they see the world it's like they built a platform basically being a pr mouthpiece for xbox and that's what they think everybody else is doing thieves see thieves everywhere right like if somebody's always cheating in a video game or in board games, they're going to suspect everybody's always doing it. So that's what everybody always suspects going on. It's like they just kind of project that on every other creator that's out there because that's quite literally how they grew. That's what Xbox did. They pivoted away from the big creators because they got caught, you know, paying people to promote their product and it wasn't divulged to the public. That was the beginning of all that regulation, by the way. That's quite literally the reason we have all this regulation. Like when you click on one of my live streams and it pops up and says elements of this, what's what's it say? What's the pop-up say? I can't remember the phrasing. If you click on one of my live streams, unless it's gameplay because I'm just in the circle, it says includes paid promotion. That's on every single one of my live streams. Do you want to know why? Because they've gotten so strict with it just wearing this t-shirt or these glasses, if I'm going to make mention of it and tell you where it's from, that's product placement, and that is then counted as a sponsored thing. I have to put that. So, like, all those rules and all those laws, it literally all came from the Xbox One era. That's where it came from. (laughs) 
we they they had to regulate the fact that there were companies paying for promotional videos and and the public wasn't being told <laughs> Now, we're a little bit off topic, but we are on topic because today, Hi-Fi Rush is on PS5. And when we're looking at the reviews, I want to see if Metacritic has added any more. I played it a little bit last night. I am going to be playing it in a little bit today. Uh, We are going to be showing off the PS5 gameplay. And I had a great time with it last night. I think it feels really, really good. Yeah, still only eight. uh, Still only eight PlayStation 5 reviews with the lowest one being an 80 from Sports Illustrated. Everybody else has given it a 90 or higher. Again, that's only eight reviews though. So basically what we've been talking about is what brought this to fruition? Why are we at a point where I consider Hi-Fi Rush to be a pretty major title? People can downplay it all they want. It's a major title. It was a it was a lightning rod title for them last year. Highly praised, award nominations, and you know, it was a shadow drop, it trended, it went viral. Now you might be like, well, you know, commercial success wasn't all that strong. Yeah, that's fine. It's Steam score is great. User score on Xbox, great. Uh, and, it, you know, it got an amazing Metacritic score. You like Hi-Fi Rush all of a sudden? No. I praised it all last year. I never had anything negative to say about it. I always said it's a great game. It's worthy of awards. It's Xbox's best game last year. My daughter beat it. I helped her whenever she would play it. The only thing I ever said was it's not a next gen game as in it is next gen. It's not a game where you would try to like showcase next gen power of the Series X. You can't show off like ray tracing. It's hard to show off high resolution with a with a Saturday morning cartoon kind of cell shaded game. It's a beautiful game, but like you can't be like, look at all the next gen graphics. It's like you kind of need games with, you know, the ray tracing and the high fidelity and the textures and the realism if you're trying to show off next gen power. So, you know, Hi-Fi is their best game last year in my opinion. It was their most consistently scored game. It was their most complete game. It was their best game last year. I said I I said that all last year. All last year I had nothing but praise for Hi-Fi Rush. You should know that, Doc. Anytime you came in and Hi-Fi came up, I always said, "Why is everybody ignoring Hi-Fi?" I called you Xbox guys out about it. I said, "You guys aren't giving Hi-Fi enough love." It's it's the strongest game they had last year. And I I talked about it and praised it more more than you did, Doc. I'm more Xbox than you. <laughs> you didn't play? My daughter played it. I helped her here and there. She beat it. Yeah, she beat it. I was busy playing uh, a co-op game with my son at the time, so I didn't get to play it. The Xbox was tied up. She played it. She beat it. I helped her sometimes. You know, a couple of the boss fights, a couple of the, um, a couple of the platforming. Yeah. So I saw practically the entire game played bits and, you know, bits of it for her to help her. And I was like, this is an amazing game. Like it was, it's a solid game from beginning to end. And I played it last night on the PlayStation. And it's better because of the dual sense doc. <laughs> I'm playing the definitive version. Really what I was doing, Doc, is I was waiting. You know, I was waiting for the best version. And, you know, and now I have it. And so now I get to play it with the the haptic feedback and the speaker and the the adaptive triggers. You know? It's it's the definitive. (laughs) Lono's daughter is more of a gamer than Doc. No, I think Doc beat Hi-Fi. Yeah. So now you're going to play it on PS5, really? Xbox tax? Well, it's not an Xbox tax, you know. It's I have all the trophies. You know, I have I have all the trophies on my Xbox account, you know. <laughs> you know, I vicariously I vicariously experience it through my daughter. Better cuz of the dual sense. I mean, you'd be mad at me. You'd be mad at me for saying that, doc. I mean, the reviews are saying the same thing. They're saying, "Listen, it it, uh, it it adds to the experience. It's more immersive, you know?" <laughs> I 
giving them flowers in May of 2023. Yeah, here's a tweet from me in May of 2023. I said, this is a false equivalency because I'm responding to uh, General MLD. I said, when is Xbox responsible for the first party games that hit their platform? Only when it's good like Hi-Fi Rush? I gave full marks to Xbox for the developer direct and Hi-Fi Rush. Said it was a big win for them. Guess I shouldn't have done that. This is back when I was having people saying, this guy says, if you go to fast food place and they get your order wrong, do you talk to the supervisor on shift or do you try to complain to the CEO in the head office? Just saying most people talk to the supervisor. I was talking about the investigations into Redfall. The game's director said the ownership change was a capital C change. Microsoft disrupted the direction of the game two and a half years into its dev cycle and they aren't to blame and had nothing to do with the game. How is that not a factor? So I was talking about Redfall. Now, I think that was before before we had good information about uh, what happened with Redfall. Because I ended up saying that that had nothing to do with Xbox. Once we got all of the details, I said Redfall is 100% on ZeniMax. 100% on ZeniMax. Um, I'm trying to find tweets where I actually talked about Hi-Fi. I don't know if I tweeted about it a lot. I said, I mostly said it in streams. I was always saying it was Xbox's strongest game last year and y'all ignored it. I feel like I pull you into console warring. I know you don't want to. I apologize. But man, you know it's fun. Well, right, Doc. Everybody knows I'm goofing when I'm talking to you and saying it with a smile on my face. Like, genuinely, genuinely, I thought that the Xbox guys fixated on... Starfield so much last year I was like yo what about hi-fi oh I remember when I did this doc I remember when I started taking up for hi-fi rush it was the game award nominations I was like like, what are y'all doing I was like Starfield's not worthy of nominations look at hi-fi hi-fi's getting nominations y'all should be celebrating that that little scrappy title shadow drops takes world by storm everybody's talking about it it goes viral and it gets nominated for awards and you're all claiming xbox tax over starfield of all games do we need to look at the steam score come on i'm more xbox than you (laughs) i was like yo high fives out of here getting nominated and nobody cares Because everybody fixated on Starfield. Your strongest game last year. Your best game. And nobody wanted to give it flowers. And now we're going to play this game like, Oh, ponies suddenly like Hi-Fi. I had nothing but praise to say about Hi-Fi last year. You remember that, right, Doc? Yeah, you came in the one day and I said that. I was like, why is nobody giving Hi-Fi credit here? Come on. Y'all worried about an Xbox tax. There definitely is an Xbox tax. Here's the thing, Doc. There's only eight reviews on Metacritic. And the danger is nobody's going to want to review it. Because they know the click rate's going to be low on a, on a Hi-Fi Rush PS5 review. Well, I actually think they're wrong. I think the click rate would be good. Because I think people want to know, is it any better? How's the port? How's the dual sense? But there's only eight reviews on Metacritic. There's 63 there's 63 Xbox reviews. The same thing happened with Baldur's Gate 3, Doc. Baldur's Gate 3 has a stronger score on Xbox. Why? There's there's like six reviews, nine reviews or something. No, I'm sorry, ten. There's like ten Baldur's Gate 3 reviews for Xbox. Why? Well, it came to Xbox last. So way less people are going to write reviews for it. So of course it's going to have a higher score on Xbox. There's less people reviewing it. How good was that I'm more Xbox than you video? They got mad at me for getting a PC. I mean... You're taking an interesting... It's an interesting strategy, Doc. You know? (laughs) It's an interesting strategy, okay? Because I can take swings at the hardcore Xbox guys because they already don't like me, okay? But a lot of them watch your videos... (laughs) And you're like, I'm more Xbox than you. (laughs) You know, you're out here on a PC, you know, telling these guys it's an interesting strategy, Doc. You know, 
Because if they decide that they don't like me and they don't want to watch me, that's not the new development. I already know that, right? They've seen how many... There's probably already 10 clips of me today, right? On average, what's that the ratio we're hitting, you know? Convincing a bunch of weird, sycophantic people to not watch me for the 25th time in a month. You don't watch this guy, you know? Oh, no! <laughs> What whatever will I do without that subset of the audience watching me? It's really it's a real threat to my business model. But you on the other hand <laughs> You on the other hand, Doc I don't know, dude. You you swinging you swinging at your sub base. <laughs> I'm more Xbox than you. I was like, okay. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> I was like, this man's, this man's saying a quiet part out loud. I was like, okay. <laughs> for some reason, Lil Nose get clipped a lot. Thanks for the free advertisement, dude. I, I, pay, I pay a man to edit and publish videos for me. I can't imagine paying the number of people who do it all day long for me for free. I don't, I don't have that kind of scratch line around. <laughs> I pre- I appreciate the free advertisement, you know, and it does me a favor, please. I really, I really, I really appreciate them convincing people that would never watch to begin with to never come here. It's, 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 it's a pleasure to have that favor done for me. Uh, it's a pleasure really is. See if thieves has big potential to be the next, uh, flavor of the month co-op game. Everyone plays. I mean, I think I'm the I, I think I'm the most curious about whether or not they'll let us turn off crossplay because I do think there is the potential there there is this potential reality where veteran players do you remember the term in Call of Duty Christmas noobs? Sea of Thieves is about to have a whole lot of Christmas noobs suddenly in their game. And I don't know if that's going to be a great runway for people to enjoy the game. Now, I will say Safer Seas will probably be, you know, actually now that I think about it, I think they created Safer Seas for this moment, if I'm honest. I think they knew our game is about to land on another platform and we have got to give new players a safe place to just kind of get their feet wet no pun intended like we've got to give people that runway of here's how this works here's how that works and they're not getting just obliterated by some player who's been playing for six years you know dude wears an eye patch when he plays like he's he means business that's probably why they developed safer seas because i don't think they were having this influx of new players six years into the life cycle of sea of thieves where there was like this strong demand for a basically a tutorial environment so i would imagine that's why they develop safer seas and maybe um when i play sea of thieves on playstation 5 i'm going to be very interested if the game attempts to put me there like are they going to try to shovel people into safer seas so that that's their first experience and then after so many hours it'll be like hey you you've kind of completed this thing that we built you're now ready for the main game Right. Just wait, bro. Hold the line. What's um, what's what's Paris saying? Paris says you'll forgive me if I don't co-sign Doom and Gloom for Xbox. If anything, it's the exact opposite. They've already told you what's coming in 2024, and we have a decent idea of what's coming in 2025. Game Pass isn't going anywhere, and we'll only get a boost with Activision Blizzard titles on the way. New hardware is coming this holiday, and next-gen hardware is not far behind. I don't have a problem with anything Paris said there. However, because I actually agree that the lineup this year does look pretty good for Xbox, starting with Hellblade in May. Um, I'm worried Indiana Jones gets... Uh, bumped to next year. Anything, anything late in the year. I'm. I, I've always said that about games late in the year. Uh, and it just in, in the marketing cycle for it seems very short. I, you know, I'm open to being wrong. I think Indiana Jones looks fun. I just have worries it'll it'll get bumped. Now, what he says about new hardware coming this holiday. 
that's probably the discless Series X. So I I hate to burst the bubble there, but I don't think that's anything significant because there's there's been new hardware rated in South Korea, and when you actually read the article, that's what it is. It's a digital Series X. So there's no confetti to throw in the air for that. Um, because the Series X is a is a freaking waste. I'll say it. Doc will say it. It's a it's a dadgum waste. Why buy it? Um, just if there's ever a time where I'm gonna say just get a PC, that's that's when I'll friggin' say it. Um, and then he says next gen hardware is not far behind. Again, I I don't see any evidence of that. Next gen hardware is not far behind. I, there's just there again. There's there is no evidence of that statement. Um, unless he's claiming to know something, I don't know if Paris, you know, got, got some inside information or something, but I, I don't see any evidence that there's next gen hardware not far behind. And Sarah Bond ta- said that the, the next generation that they're focusing on, it will be the biggest technical leap. We don't know what that means. She said nothing about performance. I think that could be the cloud h- console hybrid. And then they're going to say it's a big technical leap. You'll be able to play 4k games in your living room you know, with an internet connection. Like, if they can actually get xCloud into a better position, because currently xCloud is not in a good position. Doc says, I think Halo Infinite multiplayer on PS5 gives the game an amazing boost. Rip the Band-Aid. I actually think it makes more sense to do the Master Chief Collection, Doc. I think it makes more sense to do the Master Chief Collection, and then you launch the next Halo multiplat. Whatever next Halo they're working on, allegedly in a new engine, right? I think it makes way more sense to do the Master Chief Collection. I don't think bringing Infinite is worth it. I don't think Infinite is... Um, it's just too blemished as a game. It, it is. I just, it just... From the trailer to the delay to the multiplayer launching in beta, I, you know, I know the community has done some really cool things with Forge. I, I, don't, I don't see any reason to bring Infinite over. For all intents and purposes, they have marked Halo Infinite for death. It's it's going to get taken behind the woodshed very soon. They're like, yeah, no more seasons. That's EOL. They're signaling to the community and to the world that Halo Infinite is EOL, end of life. They're not doing any more seasons. They just finally hit a, 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 a cadence of seasons and quality and praise, and as soon as they hit that, they're like, yeah, no more seasons. Lotus Esprit with a $3 super chat tip. Thank you so much, Lotus. Guys, don't forget, every 25 I get 5, we're about halfway there. We are very soon going to be pivoting to Hi-Fi Rush PS5 gameplay. And we are about 100 members away from the goal for the week. 2,500 members will do a big community game night next week. I'll even maybe let you guys vote on what game that we play. We usually do something like Jackbox or Fall Guys or something like that. Um, So... Yeah, so help us hit this goal. We've not missed a goal in like well over a year, and uh, we've already gotten almost halfway there. You guys have been crushing it lately. We've been having amazing uh, community growth. We've had way more people active in the Discord lately as well, so thank you for that. Remember, anytime you get a gifted membership or pay for your own membership, you should be hanging out in the Discord and taking advantage of the fact that like there's people in there grouping up for Hell Divers if you're looking for people to play games with. Years would make more sense. I think a Gears collection coming to PlayStation is very likely. I think that's possibly one of the reasons we've consistently heard about the Gears collection, but it's never shown up. I wonder if they pumped the brakes on it and said, we want that to hit multiplat. Like, if we're going to launch a Gears collection, why launch it to a, 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 a floundering hardware distribution footprint and Steam when we could also launch it on PlayStation? I've reached my limit on everything but stickers. You're good, Lotus. <laughs> you go hard in the paint. Don't don't sweat it. Let 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 other people pick up the gifted member slack. You're good. You went crazy last week. It it would not surprise me at all. I forgot to mention the coffee today. It would not surprise me at all if that's why we kept hearing about the Gears collection and it just hasn't shown up yet. Like, why would you be waiting, like, all this time? It's like there's been, there were, you know, there's the drought in 2022. Um, I guess last year you didn't really need it. They had, the game quality wasn't there, but they had the cadence. They hit the cadence that Phil Spencer wants to hit. You know? Helldivers 2 is actually the Halo killer, who would have thought? I don't believe in game killers. I don't think that that's a thing. I think there's, there's very few instances where you could claim 
one game hurt or killed another. I think Overwatch hurt Bloodborne. Um, I'm sorry, hurt Battleborns. Uh, Bloodborne. I think Overwatch significantly hurt Battleborn, the Gearbox title. Uh, Battleborn came out and at like the exact same time the Overwatch demo hit and Overwatch was just superior in every way. And that's one of the few instances where I could say there's a very direct correlation of one game harming another game's reception, popularity, and player funnel. But I don't think anybody, I can't be convinced that Helldivers is done or is doing anything to Halo. Um, I think that Halo largely has put itself out of the frame. Um, I fault Microsoft mostly for that and what they did to 343. I think that should be something that's analyzed internally. Why, why you would let one of your uh, flagship titles be so mistreated? So I, I, you know, I would hope that they would say, you know. We, we need to reconsider how we position and how we build Halo. I, I think that 343 needs to be equipped to succeed. I would love to see id Software help out. I think id, the guys from Doom, I think they could bring a lot of greatness to Halo. So, um, yeah. I, but I don't, I don't buy into the idea that like uh, one game can kill another. You know, there's been so many games that are allegedly going to be the Destiny killer the cod killer i no games that get to that kind of like level of popularity like i don't even think you could truly kill halo i don't Se- the second season of the tv show is doing very well um i think it has brand recognition i think it has nostalgia halo has a lot in its corner that they can leverage i think they need to i think they need to be in a new engine i think the slip space engine absolutely hamstrung them i think it really hurt uh, infinite. I think they need to get out from underneath the 18 month contractual policy. They need way more FTE on staff. Um, and, you know, I think they just need to. I also think they need to reboot. I think they need to do a reboot. I know people don't agree with me. I know they don't agree with me. I know Halo fans think that's a, absolutely that's a preposterous suggestion. But I think it needs a reboot. I think you need to basically start over and let people kind of embrace the game anew the way they did with Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. Now, I'm not saying do the same thing. I don't want Halo to feel like Doom, but I think you need to do that soft reboot where you honor the game of the past with the game in the present and give non-fans a reason to come and play because if it looks like, feels like, smells like Halo, you're literally just making it for the core audience, which will shrink every year. The core audience will continue to shrink every year. They won't grow. It just doesn't stand to reason that you have this monsoon of people that you should be targeting with a looks like, smells like Halo. I don't think that that will work. Um, Then they kind of reboot Halo with Infinite. Um, Yes and no. I agree with you as a Halo fan, mainly because I am banned in Infinite and Master Chief Collection is better. Co-op story narrative as what Halo is known for. Pivoting away from that was a mistake. Yeah, I agree. I would love a Halo campaign with up to four-player co-op. Um, you know, larger areas, larger battles. Add more bombast. And yes, I think I do. I think you need to speed speed movement up. Um, I think you need to embrace more space fantasy. I think it needs to. I think it needs to feel like Doom and Destiny and classic Halo had a baby. That's what I think it would need to feel like. It needs the injection of id Software's arena shooter expertise. It needs the space magic injection from Destiny. It needs the feel and the vibe and the music and the identity from classic Halo. I think you put all those things in a blender and I think that would be the, the right track. Halo Infinite's good. I love that game. Uh, I think the Xbox exclusive automatically gives games a bad rap. No, I think what... I think what gave Halo Infinite a bad rap was that multiplayer launched in a beta and was missing features and playlists were glitched for three months and their XP payout was terrible and the way you progressed the battle pass was terrible. They made like 18 different live service faux pas and didn't fix them in a timely manner at all. People forget Halo Infinite scored an 87 on Metacritic. Yeah, that's the campaign. 
the multiplayer is not included in those reviews. So if the multiplayer was included in those reviews, it would not be that high because there would be people then scoring the game based on the fact that multiplayer was a beta, features were missing, playlists were missing, playlists were glitched and bugged, everybody hated the battle pass, and they couldn't make quick fixes to the battle pass, they couldn't just give us XP at the end of a round, even their answer to XP at the end of a round was stupidly designed because it made more sense to play two or three games a day and stop playing instead of doing long play sessions, which is antithetical to the history of live service shooters. They make Made so many mistakes like okay the, the, the campaign got a good score okay Th- that means nothing in the grand scheme of things no forge on launch you know classic game modes missing no co-op at launch no replaying missions at launch I also you, you don't want to talk about an Xbox tax you go and read those reviews man they're, they they mention all the missing features and all the disappointments and then they give it like a nine. It like doesn't add up. There's like a disconnect. The scores are so dislodged from the reviews. I remember reading Halo Infinite reviews and being like, that review was kind of critical. That review had some some genuine gripes and they gave it such a high score. IGN gave the multiplayer a nine out of ten. I don't know why. I don't know why. The Halo community was very much, very much dissatisfied and critical of that game. Go look at any Halo content creator in the months that followed. Everyone was playing the game. Everyone was playing the game. I was playing the game, Doc. I covered the game for a month. And I'm here to tell you, The Halo community was not happy. They hit their all-time peak on Steam of 272,000 players. 272,000 players was their all-time peak. And in a matter of... When did the game launch? What was was Halo Infinite's uh, multiplayer launch date? I got to set up the next stream, by the way. It's noon, December the 8th. Oh, no, the beta multiplayer launched on the 15th, and then the campaign released on the 8th. So the beta of the multiplayer launched on November the 15th, and in a matter of one month, the player base numbers on Steam had dropped from peaks of like 200,000 to peaks of 100,000. By the time it got to January, they were only hitting peaks of like 50,000. That's what I'm saying. Like, that opening month, a bunch of us played it. I covered it for a whole month. Every Friday, I was doing community game nights with Halo Infinite. And I'm here to tell you, the Halo community was very quickly not satisfied because stuff was missing, stuff didn't work, playlists were glitched, and fixes came at a snail's pace. Fixes and updates came at a snail's pace. Like, a 272,000 player peak on Steam is respectable. That's a good number. But they didn't keep anybody because there was all those problems. Two spot from Richrod. Doc uh, and IGN gave Starfield a 7. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about comparing review scores. Stop this nonsense. When Halo Infinite dropped, it broke Steam records. 272,000 concurrence isn't breaking any records. What are you talking about? 272,000 concurrent players is not breaking a record. What do you... That's not true, Doc. No. And it quickly lost the players on PC. Mouse and keyboard was so bad. I remember. I remember talking to people who were playing Halo Infinite on PC and the reviews and the feedback from the PC guys were like, mouse and keyboard feels terribly. It hasn't been optimized or built for PC and mouse, uh, for mouse and keyboard well at all. Oh my gosh. The revisionist history on Halo Infinite will not stand, man. I covered that game for a month. I'm more Xbox than you. I was in the trenches. I played it every Friday night. And the PC community did not receive that game well. Look it up. You have Google. It was also a free game, says Hilly. Yeah, for a free game, it didn't even crack 300,000. Halo Infinite broke Steam records. 
Okay, they broke Xbox Game Studios record. That's the record they broke. Doc. Halo Infinite amasses record-breaking 270,000 concurrent players on Steam. The first Xbox Studios game to reach such a notable player count. That's the record they broke. They they broke Xbox's record. Why are you so dismissive of the campaign? I'm not dismissive of the campaign. I said it was good, but who cares about that when the multiplayer launches in a beta? Like The Halo Infinite revisionist history is remarkable to me. We got a post-mortem from Jason Schreier. Half the staff was on a contract walking out the door every 18 months. That game was in crisis mode. It barely gets out the door. They cut two-thirds of the world and the campaign and all of that stuff that they had built. They shrink it all down and get it out the door. And the can- and the multiplayer launches in a beta. Missing features, missing playlists, glitches, bugs, weeks to fix certain things, and, a, and an XP earn rate, and a way of working through the, the battle pass that was decried as terrible. And you're like, oh, it broke Xbox's record. What record? What? How many Steam games had Xbox pushed over there that could have even set a record at that point? Other than the Master Chief Collection. It was a beta! What are we even talking about? And this is what it always comes down to. It's like talking to a Glory Days quarterback. We're going to ignore the fact that 2022 was a ghost town. We're going to ignore the fact that three out of the four games have terrible consumer reception. Terrible scores. Three out of the four games last year. We're just going to ignore all that and do this Glory Days quarterback nonsense. We're like, well, Halo Infinite was great. No, it wasn't. We've just gotten far enough away from the damage that when you say it, people are like, yeah, it actually wasn't that bad. Now it's a beta. It doesn't count. Doc, it was a game people were waiting on. It was a game that was supposed to be a launch title. It was a game that was delayed, and the multiplayer launched in a beta with glitches and bugs. Where are your standards, man? You have standards. You bought the Series X. You didn't stand for the 30 FPS nonsense. Where are your standards? That multiplayer beta... That's why they lost players hand over fist. It didn't run well on PC for mouse and keyboard. Missing features, glitches, and bugs, and a battle pass that was a joke in how it was designed. Come on. I got to schedule the gameplay stream of Hi-Fi Rush. We're going to have to scramble if we're going to hit 25 members in this stream. We've not missed that goal for over a year and a half. Let's 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 hit it, boys. We're going to have to scramble. You guys are going to have 10 minutes. I'm going to schedule this thing for 12:15. We're going to redirect and play this game on the PS5. And I'm going to have to I'm probably going to just have to swap HDMI cables so I don't have to swap devices. That might be the best way to do this since my um, my stinking cap card. I think it's the USB that's going bad, personally. Apparently, Noisy Pixel's being called out about People are bringing up an old tweet from our PS5 reviewer that said he initially refunded the game on Steam last year due to bad music. Um, in the review, he wrote he hasn't played the game. Considering the mass amounts of games he reviews, this is a little normal. I personally forget that I even reviewed a game months after playing it. That's the reality of these three and four people operations. However, gamers are allowed to change our minds. I didn't enjoy... Uh, uh, Final Fantasy X when I first played it and then it became one of my favorites. Those who asked why we had him review it, Bailey and I are the only ones close to full-time reviewers currently. If a game... I'm not going to keep reading that. So apparently they were they were getting called out. 
Keithius with the 20 bomb and Cardock Wren with the 10 bomb. Unbelievable. We're like all the way here at the buzzer, boys. And these guys take us all the way on the doorstep of a second milestone on the day. I already owe you guys five. Good night. What a huge push out of nowhere. And a super chat from Mr. Grimm. Five dollars for Mr. Grimm. I don't know how you do it, Lono, but debating with someone who believes in the Xbox tax is like debating with a flat earther. I just don't engage. I like Doc. Doc's a friend of the show. He says a lot of this stuff with a smirk and a twinkle in his eye. I don't think he's goofing on Halo Infinite, though. I think he genuinely believes that that game was at a caliber and quality when it came out that I just, I don't agree with him. I don't. I covered that game and played that game extensively and the revisionist history will not stand. I played it with the community every Friday night. We had community game night every Friday night as a part of our member push with Hilly and we had a blast with that game. But to act like it shot out of a cannon was some high value game, high quality game, no. No. Campaign, yes. Multiplayer, absolutely not. Stop rewriting history. They got they got the, the multiplayer and things into a better state after how many years? Well, I don't care about that. Who cares about that now? Yo, Darius Ward gives a member and takes us to 41. If we hit 100 today, we secure the 2,500 goal. I'll gift. Tw- I'll drop a 20 bomb. You guys have got time. We can do it. The gamers don't agree with him? Yeah, like if the multiplayer was so good, then why did people vacate the games to dadgum fast? How long has Helldivers been out? How long? Let's compare. Do you want to compare a game that's actually retaining its players? Because Halo Infinite didn't. What was Helldivers' release date? What was it? How many weeks are we in now? February the 8th. We are officially... Let me just count the weeks. One, two, three, four, five. We are almost six weeks in. We're two days shy of six weeks. We are six weeks in, and look at the way Helldivers is retaining a player base. That's a successful multiplayer game. Halo Infinite didn't keep players for what a couple, like two or three weeks in. It just in the toilet on Steam. Just. And everybody's going to be like, will more people play on Xbox? You can't brag about a record-breaking Steam concurrent number and then say, well, most people play on Xbox. You don't get to have it both ways. You either hit the Steam record and then failed to hold those players or Steam doesn't matter. Pick one. You can't have it both ways. You want to tout your Steam record then answer me why so many people stopped playing so quickly on Steam if it was such a good game and in such a good state. I mean, everybody was playing, sure. Everybody was playing uh, New World when it first came out, and there was mass player exit shortly after because the end game wasn't designed well and they hadn't thought through certain things. Having a ton of people play your game in the launch doesn't mean much when they all walk away that fast. I'm curious to see Helldivers numbers next month. I actually am curious how long they can maintain the the player numbers. I am. Cuz I think they're doing a they're doing a phenomenal job. But I also think it's an incredibly difficult task to maintain a player base. It just really is. It's really tough. They're crushing it. They're doing a, it for for the outfit size that they are and their game kind of coming on the scene, completely changing from a top-down to a third person action game there's the five members that i owe you i'll owe you five more if we can hit the the 50 i'm gonna do something really quickly to ensure that we can actually see gameplay give me one second Okay, pray that that worked because I don't want to have to start swapping USB cables and make my dadgum computer freak out. Okay.
resolution not supported for resizing. Okay, so we're going to have to go in here and do... How do I get it? Do I just do device default? There we go. This thing is not set up for um, HDR. Like that looks freaking terrible. I have to shut eight. I think I have to shut HDR off. And. need audio um video game device monitor only which freaking device is this oh I know how to find out going here into properties live gamer ultra video Okay, hang on a second. I'm not able... I hear my... I hear my PlayStation. But how? It's muted. Where is it coming through? I don't understand how we're hearing it. I have everything muted in OBS, so I have no control over the volume. I don't get how we're hearing it. I just made it to where you guys couldn't hear it. Okay, there we go. Okay. Okay. Now, I want you guys to hear it, but I want to be able to control the volume, and I had no way of controlling the volume because I, I didn't have the, the volume bar. It's configuring HDR right now, which I'm going to have to turn off because this capture card's not configured for it. So you guys are getting, like, a terrible picture. Hang on a second. You're getting like it, it, it this I'm having to use a different capture card than I typically use and it does not it just does not like HDR. It like mutes all the colors. There we go. Now you guys are getting a better. I don't I just I don't want colors muted for it. For a game like Hi-Fi. Cuz like it's such a beautiful game. What's Lord Horg doing? You guys are telling Lord Horg to chill? What's Lord Horg saying? He says, dude, shut it down, you clown. You don't, don't be insulting Doc, man. He's a friend of the show, Lord Horg. Chill, 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 homie, chill. Why are you moving the goalposts? No one's arguing Helldivers. Helldivers is doing great. All I'm saying is Halo Infinite is not as bad as people make it out to be. Doc, I was supplying you with evidence of a game that's holding its players, which means it's doing well and it's a good game. If Halo Infinite was so good, then why did players abandon it in mass on PC? You can't brag about breaking a Steam record, 272,000 players, and then they all leave. Like, they lost their players so fast. That's what I was saying. I think that's evidence of the quality of the game not retaining the players. That's what I think. 
So, I always love your perspective, Doc. I always like that you have a different viewpoint and a different vantage point. You know, and what's it's what makes the world interesting, right? I just I don't see it the way you see it when it comes to Halo Infinite. I played and covered that game a lot and was very very disappointed in how it launched. I was looking forward to it. I hyped it up. You know, I really did. Okay. Um, all right, guys, do me a favor. We are going to be switching to a gameplay stream momentarily. Can you guys smash the heck out of the like button? Let's get 20 more likes. Let's get to 300 likes. Um, make sure you've hit subscribe if you haven't already. I've gifted the members that I'm going to gift that I owe, but we are really close to another goal. 41 out of 50. You guys hit 50. I'll gift more. That's about halfway of what we need to hit the weekly goal that we're going for. Uh, we are going for um, a goal of 2,500 this week. So if you guys hit 100 members today, that'll be a total of 20 gifted for me, and that's all we need to hit 2,500. And then we can go for the next goal of 2,750. So... Give me a very, very quick moment to go quickly use the restroom before we dive into gameplay. I'm not going to make it. We're going to get like five minutes into gameplay and I'm going to have to use the restroom. Let me make sure my controller's got full battery. Okay. I'll be right back. Uh, Enjoy the music. And we'll be diving in and I'll be showing you guys Hi-Fi Rush. I have gone through the the game's opening and story and tutorial. So you're going to get to see gameplay. I'll show you how the mechanics work and how... I don't think this game feels like a rhythm game. So if you're like, I don't really like rhythm games. I don't think this game feels like a rhythm game. I think you can enjoy it even if you're not a fan of rhythm games. So I'll be right back.
Okay. Sorry about that. You first. Okay. All right, we need to make sure this is the featured video on the channel. I'll provide you guys with a link in just a second. Uh, let's change. I want to change the thumbnail on this. And thanks for the support yesterday, guys. That, um, that stream with Kirk about Rise of the Ronin absolutely crushed yesterday. YouTube finally treating us right. We showed up in search results. A lot of people clicked. That's thanks to you guys. When you, when you help a stream like that start strong, uh, and get, get good, good response and likes and all of that. So, um, hi, by rush PS five gameplay. And okay, let's send out that tweet. All right. All right. Link is in the chat. That is where we are headed. Okay. And I'm going to redirect you guys as well. Remember, as soon as we get over to the stream, man, go crazy on the like button. It's super, super helpful. Thanks so much for checking out this gameplay of Hi-Fi Rush on PS5. So this will be Hi-Fi Rush PS5 gameplay. I have gone through sort of the opening tutorial and cutscenes just so we could get to the meat of the gameplay. I want to kind of show off the mechanics. I really want to show you why I don't think this game feels like a rhythm game my daughter played it on xbox and loved it i helped her every once in a while but i never really got a feel for the game because i was playing it just in little spurts now that i've spent some time during the opening and played it by myself not you know not having to hand the controller back or anything like that i'm not a huge fan of rhythm games and i really don't think this game feels like a rhythm game so i'm going to show it to you we're going to dive right in i am running streamer mode so i'm going to end the previous stream and i'm going to redirect people over we talked about the reviews this morning and uh, we had a really, really great time. So I'm going to continue my game where I left off yesterday.